I'd like to thank everyone for coming today on this uh, beautiful uh, sunny Sunday afternoon. And I guess our question is just, uh, was, it, was it free will that brought you here today? Or <laughs> free will for those who decided to stay out in the sun? Um, my name is Paul Gailey. Um, uh, Bob Pollock and I, who, uh, where, where is Bob? He's, he, there's Bob Pollock, <laughs> excuse me. Bob Pollock and I uh, are, will be your host uh, for the next day or two. And um, uh, we, we would just like to welcome you here today and uh, appreciate your participation. Uh, before we begin, uh, please join me in thanking the CSSR staff uh, for the incredible job that they've done in organizing this meeting. And um, uh, Bob Pollack and I will take responsibility for, for coming up with this wild idea, but the ones who really made it happen are here, uh, especially Eleni Nikotopoulos, who's the conference organizer, uh, also Ossian Foley, Stuart Gill, Miranda Hawkins, Aaron Lothus, uh, Keely McPherson, oh, and also I should say Timon McPherson uh, there as well, uh, uh, Wei Yi Mu, Cynthia Peabody, Andrew Sinanoglu, and also uh, uh, Kelly Treater, who uh, doesn't show up on there right now. And uh, if you could all stand just for, for a moment, um, we really owe this conference to them. So let's give them a hand. Uh, the CSSR has created an excellent environment for these talented individuals to come together and generate many remarkable products, uh, including this meeting. And uh, it, it's a special, especially invigorating uh, to work uh, with these talented individuals uh, who, as you can see, are, are very creative in, in what they're able to put together. I uh, also would like to say a very deep thank you to all the speakers uh, who came to participate. Some of them traveled uh, quite a distance. Others are, are right here, but still took their time on uh, Sunday and Monday uh, to speak. Um, they're the ones who make this possible. And we'd also uh, like to express uh, gratitude to the Earth Institute, uh, which hosts the CSSR, which is the, uh, the umbrella institute uh, that the CSSR is part of. So thank you also to the Earth Institute. Uh, from the Fetzer Institute, I'm joined here today uh, by David Addis, who's Senior Program Officer, and uh, you can see these names here, um, Wayne Ramsey, Kate Olson, and Rob Lehman, who's the uh, chairman of the board. And if you'd like to learn more about the Fetzer Institute or the CSSR, you can tune into the websites there. Um, before introducing our opening speaker, I'd like to say just a few words about the topic and about the program. The question is, why re-examine free will? Uh, this has been a question that has uh, preoccupied a human interest for millennia. And uh, we could just ask ourselves, why would we want to revisit this question now in the 21st century? And that's what I'd like to address uh, briefly as we get started here today. In the past, it was mainly the province of philosophers and theologians. Uh, but I would like to make the case today that the subject uh, is of a critical and immediate importance to all of us uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, many of them interconnecting, and we'll hear many different viewpoints uh, today and tomorrow. No one perspective will suffice in addressing what is becoming an increasingly important issue of both scientific and human dimensions. I'll go even further in stating that too rigid a grasp on any one perspective will likely lead us astray into, uh, into narrow ideologies that don't fully uh, uh, express the richness of human experience. The Fetzer Institute and the CSSR hope that this symposium will serve not only to inform, but to stimulate your thinking about both the intrigue and the importance of the question of free will in its modern incarnation. We'll explore the question from the perspectives of neuroscience, philosophy, physics, psychiatry, theology, economics, and evolutionary biology, to name a few, uh, in addition to touching on the important implications in ethics and justice. Over a hundred years ago, William James wrote, the whole sting and excitement of our voluntary life depends on our sense that in it 
things are really decided from one moment to another, and that it is not the dull rattling off of a chain that was forged innumerable ages ago. More recently, we, we can see in the writings of Daniel Wegner from Harvard, this means that conscious will is an illusion. It is an illusion in the sense that the experience of consciously willing an action is not a direct indication that the conscious thought has caused the action. Many of us are also aware of the experiments of uh, Dr. Benjamin Libet, who passed away recently, which indicates that the body initiates an action uh, uh, before we are even consciously aware of making the decision. I'm sure we'll hear more on these topics uh, today and tomorrow, uh, but we have to ask ourselves right from the beginning, can we assume then that the verdict is really in? Do we really understand free will in this day and time and what its implications are for us today? Unfortunately, the answer is no, I, uh, at least in my opinion. I think that the answers we have so far only raise a new series of questions. Uh, Conclusions that are based on the uh, Libet experiments and sim similar work follow a very simple logic, that is, that a cause must precede an effect. And so we're working on that, that basic logic. What is our concept of free will? Is it that we as humans are able to originate causes? Are we almost a white hole, you might say, of cause? Are we a source of cause in the universe where, where things can independently happen? where causation can originate. The problem already begins to take on a, a, a philosophical dimension and also a dimension from physics and the other sciences. In physics, we're faced with an interesting problem. That is, in a mechanistic model of the universe, there are no new causes after the Big Bang. The rest happens as a consequence. But again, the plot thickens. We know from the newer disciplines of nonlinear dynamics and self-organization that nonlinear systems with instabilities, which represent a very large part of nature, evolve according to physical law, but are intrinsically unpredictable. It turns out that the weatherman, we were right all along about the weatherman, he really can't predict the weather. In fact, it's, it's not only uh, difficult, it's impossible even in principle. Studies of the solar system by Poincaré over 100 years ago revealed these truths, and more recent studies from Lorenz to Hawken, uh, Hawken and uh, Prigogine and others uh, have only exper expanded on this paradoxical story. They've proven uh, that, that it truly is impossible to make these kinds of predictions. But herein uh, lays another layer of mystery. Self-organizing systems uh, or emergent systems such as a hurricane, your heartbeat, or for that matter, uh, the activity of your, of your brain, twist our logic into a Mobius strip. Our conclusions about free will were based on the simple linear logic of cause leading to an effect. What could be more unassailable than that? Yet in the self-organizing systems mentioned, causality takes on a very substantial topological twist. The model of linear causality fails because in these systems, the causality is circular, something like a hermeneutic circle. It is the interaction between air molecules that give rise to a hurricane, but it is the large-scale structure of the hurricane that entrains and gives order to the air molecules. Giving a gift may represent uh, part of the process of developing a friendship, but the friendship may also be the reason behind giving the gift. While we normally think of bottom-up causality in science, for example, neuronal activity giving rise to mental activity, self-organizing systems demonstrate inescapably that top-down causality is equally as important. There is no little man inside a galaxy running from star to star, telling them each how to behave in order to form the beautiful spiral structures. Any more than there is an independent agent telling the molecules of the hurricane how to organize themselves. We can't identify a cause for these self-organizing systems just as we can't find the beginning of a circle. Now what does this new but very relevant and demonstrable geometry of logic do to our question of free will? 
On first thought, it may force us to question the structure of our questions rather than finding contentment with the tentative answers. Perhaps it is also fair game to ask what this implies about the entire scientific enterprise. If we in fact do not have free will, what is the meaning of a scientific experiment? Is the entire process not predicated on the belief that the experimenter has a choice in how he or she sets up the experiment? If we maintain that the subjects of our experiments do not have free will, must we not also admit that neither the researcher, the journal reviewer, or us as readers are in the same situation? How can we then understand our own scientific findings? And who or what is the watcher? Such questions are surely incomplete if we fail to mention quantum physics. Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, Bohm, and others struggled with the strange finding that the choice of the experimenter determines what we previously thought to be immutable, objective reality. Physicist John Wheeler states that we as observers are free to decide in which way we will bring quantum phenomena to, its, to their conclusion. In choosing our measuring devices, we decide which phenomenon can become reality and which cannot. Wheeler goes as far as to interpret the individual quantum events as elementary acts of creation. Are there indeed fresh causes in the universe? Is this a sort of elementary free will? These are, believe it or not, actually not backwater ideas in physics. A recent paper that came out in the Foundations of Physics is entitled The Free Will Theorem. And in this paper, the investigators from Princeton examine the question of free will both on the part of the experimenters as well on the, as on the part of the quantum phenomenon. But let's leave the deeper thinking about these scientific issues to the speakers that follow and consider for a moment what all these new findings mean to us on a human level. In just the past few years, major efforts have begun in the new fields of neuro law, neuromarketing, neuroethics, neurotheology, and others. We as human beings are in the process of redefining ourselves and the implications are stunning. If there is no conscious self originating our actions, if we are not sovereign sources of our own will, does the door open wider towards brain engineering? Thomas Metzinger of the University of Mainz asks, what is a good state of consciousness? What would be the best state of the human brain for a global society? So in looking at this, we, we begin to ask ourselves, should we as human beings leave behind the concepts of the sanctity of an individual? Shall we engineer ourselves to better get along? A couple quotes from uh, Metzinger. Whenever we understand the specific neural dynamics underlying a specific form of conscious content, we can, in principle, delete, amplify, or modulate this content. Neuroscience is now quickly transformed into neurotechnology. I predict that parts of neurotechnology will turn into consciousness technology. Will human beings re resist using such technologies? And if not, with what motives will these be used? We need not stretch our imaginations very far to guess how they will be used by marketers, governments, and others who wish to induce one group or another to conform to their desires. And all this may be closer than you imagine. The March 20th issue of, of the journal Nature includes a paper entitled Identifying Natural Images from Human Brain Activity. The researchers are successively uh, successfully re, uh, reconstructing from fMRI data the image that the subject is seeing mentally. So these technologies are being developed rapidly. We will be faced with many questions in the coming years. Shall we re-engineer the brains of criminals? Shall we change our system of justice that is based on the concept of choice and self-responsibility? What will be our ethics? I hope this brief introduction piques your interest and persuades you that it, it is indeed time to revisit the question of free will in a serious way. Nothing less than our vision of ourselves as human beings 
and the basis for the way we live together is at stake. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs. Dr. Sachs is director of the Earth Institute, if you tell it, professor of sustainable development and professor of health policy and management here at Columbia University. He's also a special advisor to United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, as well as president and co-founder of the Millennium Promise Alliance, a nonprofit organization aimed at ending extreme global poverty. Dr. Sachs is widely considered to be the leading international economic advisor of his generation. And in 2004 and 2005, he was named among the 100 most influential leaders in the world by Time Magazine. He's the author of hundreds of scholarly articles and many books, including the New York Times bestseller, The End of Poverty. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sachs. You want that. Good, that's fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Why am I here, you may want to know. I'm an economist in a room full of neuroscientists, biologists, philosophers, and theologians. And as Paul Gailey just noted, all of us are no doubt asking ourselves, are we really here of our own free will? Is this for me a compulsion as director of the Earth Institute? Am I in a reverie that I know something useful about this topic? At one level, the answer is easy. Bob Pollack asked me, and I always say yes to Bob. But of course, that just pushes the problem back one level without resolving it. Why do I say yes? Here I would insist free will truly is at play. When Bob asks, my prefrontal cortex jumped into action. Yes, I could imagine in my mind's eye today's conference. I knew that it would be rewarding. No doubt my dopamine began to jump. I'm sure that my limbic system also jumped into play as well. Fear, after all, could not be far away. What on earth could I talk about? Here came the adrenaline surge and the beginning of the fight-flight response, and I underline flight. But then the hippocampus and its long-term memories of the Columbia campus kicked in. I remembered that when Bob asked me to speak about love, I ended up loving the occasion and learning a lot as well. In the end, the prefrontal cortex ended the discussion with my amygdala. The adrenaline subsided. The prefrontal cortex executive command issued orders to move my fingers on the keyboard. Yes, of course, Bob, I'll be delighted to come, I typed. And here I am. The issue of free will is, of course, an age-old question, but we can now approach it with breathtaking, if still limited, scientific advances. In a general sense, I believe today we are engaging in consilience, E.O. Wilson's concept of the jumping together of knowledge. Like Ed Wilson, I believe that neurobiology has the potential to provide one of the great breakthroughs of our time, perhaps the best chance to better understand our human natures and to act usefully upon that knowledge. Our human consci consciousness and our human conscience are being opened up to dazzling scientific inquiry. The evolutionary and physiological bases of human behavior are being elucidated before our eyes. And our belief, as ancient as the Buddha and Socrates, that by knowing ourselves we can lead richer lives and have more productive societies, I also believe can be brought closer to fruition. Free will is partly about the ancient mind-body problem. Is there a mind separate from the brain? Is the mind the soul? Can the mind shape the brain? Can the mind cause action? It is, of course, also about the basic questions of cause and effect, as Paul just noted. If the mind can cause action, what causes the mind to take the decisions that cause action? I will use free will in one main sense, actions that are taken after conscious self-reflection even if, or particularly if, 
those decisions are based coherently on goal-oriented cause and effect motivations. In human terms, I would suggest free will does not mean a lack of preceding causes, but rather a grounded and functional self-awareness of those causes. Cognitive neuroscience, with the added perspective of evolutionary psychology, can help us to make much better sense of these ancient questions. Moreover, growing experimental evidence, including through powerful instruments such as functional magnetic resonance imaging and the studies of brain lesions, are uncovering the very physical states of our brain that correspond with our mental states, and hence our decision-making, emotions, and behaviors. Free will can be studied fruitfully in this context. Indeed, such productive opportunities have never before existed. Here are a few things I think the science of mind and brain are helping us to see. And of course, I'm eager to hear from the real experts. First, the brain is the seat of the mind, and brain structures shape the functioning of the mind. The world of science is largely abandoned for compelling reasons, the brain-body dualism of Descartes. Neural systems correspond with modes of cognition, emotion, and other conscious and unconscious repertoires of mind. Second, the human brain has been built in the course of evolution through an accretion of levels of function and structure. Famously, we still have our reptilian brain. Elliot Spitzer just proved it again. We have overlays of ancient and almost abandoned brain functions, such as the visual centers of the midbrain, which have been mostly supplanted by the visual centers of the frontal cortex. The human brain has been built up mainly by adding new parts to older working models. Third, like many complex systems, and for reasons brilliantly outlined by the Nobel laureate of decision science, Herbert Simon, the brain is indeed a hierarchical and semi-decomposable system of subsystems, including the cognitive and sensory components of the prefrontal cortex, the emotional mechanisms of the limbic system, the memory functions of the hippocampus, the sexual urges and homeostatic feedbacks of the hypothalamus, the reward centers of the midbrain, the social cues of the anterior cingulated cortex, and countless others. This is the only way for a complex system of 100 billion neurons and roughly 500 trillion synapses to have evolved with modular subcomponents. Fourth, in this context, who we are, our self and our sense of self or our sense of I, our very consciousness is best understood as an emergent property in that it is built up by the highly complex interactions of these subcomponents, or as is regularly said, there is no homunculus that is calling the shots. What we are is the action of these interacting subcomponents. Consciousness and the sense of self is indeed a recent addition to nature, essentially human traits made possible by the vast increase of our frontal cortex. Fifth, our sense of an integrated self, together with the closely related sense of consciousness, not the same, but closely related, yields our species huge advantages in natural selection and cultural transmission. Self and consciousness lie at the core of successful problem solving, complex goal attainment, and social cooperation. The old Bantu proverb, I am because you are, may be excellent evolutionary psychology as well as good village ethics. Mental health is marked by the successful integration of these components. When they disintegrate, we say that a person has decompensated, then help is urgently needed. Sixth, even though the self is an emergent property, there is also a meaningful sense in which the self can integrate the subsystems 
and then loop back to instruct these same subsystems. The neurological evidence points to the special role of the prefrontal cortex as the main integrative center, which is hardwired to bring information from the sensory components, the emotions in the limbic system, long-term memory, and the unconscious into an attentive working memory, and then confront that information with goal-oriented behavior and possible behavioral responses. The prefrontal cortex then sends back instructions to the rest of the brain for implementation of decisions. Seven, free will, I believe, emerges when our conscious selves are successfully integrating knowledge and coherently making goal-based decisions. This, we now better understand, does not mean overriding our emotions by our cognition, an earlier viewpoint that has proved to be fallacious. Rather, it means integrating our emotions, cognition, and instinctive reactions in a highly functional manner, consistent with our human nature and our sociability. Eight, free will, it seems to me, is a matter of degree. We become more free the more we understand our own minds and brains, our conscious and unconscious motivations, our instincts, and our problem solving. A conference like this, I believe, can indeed help to set us free. Nine, one of the key functions of consciousness is gap filling, meaning that our brains fill in the gaps of what we see, hear, think, and believe about the environment in which we live and operate. Our consciousness indeed creates narratives that make sense of a vast amount of sporadic and haphazard information. In the words of neurologist David Linden, our consciousness creates, quote, coherent, gap-free stories. This is a remarkable feature of an efficient, highly adaptive, and goal-oriented decision-making system. But of course, it can cause a lot of trouble as well. For 10, the mind can easily be tricked in countless ways. For example, one, assuming that we have conscious will, for decisions which were really taken unconsciously. Two, attributing causes to patterns when none exist. Three, misperceiving objects and people according to the cues, framing, and priming in which those objects and people are introduced. And four, relatedly, being vulnerable in countless ways to misattribution of cause suggestibility and pervasive biases such as the placebo effect and many others. Specifically, the sense of free will itself can be illusory in the ways that Daniel Wegner's famous study, The Illusion of Conscious Will, describes. We may believe that we are consciously integrating knowledge to pursue our goals when in fact we are simply responding, or I shouldn't say simply, we are responding to unconscious processes. The famous work of Benjamin Libet, already mentioned by Paul, demonstrated that unconscious signals precede conscious knowledge in some decisions. Similarly, it is entirely possible to induce experimental subjects to take decisions that are controlled by the experimenter, such as raising a right or left arm, while all of the time the subject thinks that the decisions are being freely made. Wegner terms this the illusion of control. Similarly, he points to the remarkable cases of automatism, as he calls it, such as hypnosis, in which individuals engage in complex behaviors with no conscious willing of their actions. These examples exemplify the truth that consciousness, the self, and the will are emergent properties, and that it's possible to trick or substitute our or possible to trick our brains by hijacking one or more of the underlying components of our brain functions. But this does not mean that all is illusion. The fact that our senses can be tricked does not mean that our eyes always lie. Nor does the ability to trick our will mean that our decisions are also always a lie. So I think that the Wegner analysis shows exceptions that should be regarded as exceptions, not the predominant rule that somehow prove that all is illusion. 
Why does all of this matter and matter urgently? For three critical reasons, I believe. First, we can better understand ourselves. Second, we can hope to improve ourselves as individuals. And third, and of much interest to me as a social scientist, we can help to build social institutions more attuned to our human nature and therefore more adept at avoiding some of the traps of human nature, most notably violence, war, and discrimination between us versus them, all of which seem to be hardwired to some extent as a result of our species' long sojourn in the African savanna during the formative period of our cortex. Yet hardwired does not mean immutable or impervious to moderation. That, I think, is the point of social institutions. On the individual level, we are better off to see our struggles between temptation and rationality, not as the work of the devil, but as the work of ingrained tendencies in the brainstem, the limbic system, and the cortex. That's not an idle observation, I believe, but an operational one. By better knowing the reasons for our actions, by understanding that we are indeed guided by overwhelming unconscious urges as well as conscious ones, by uncovering those in a scientific way which Sigmund Freud could not hope to do, we can indeed hope to find some respite from the hard struggles of life. In a recent very fine book, Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain, science journalist Sharon Begley describes how patients with obsessive compulsive disorders were, for the first time, able to confront and overcome their disorders when they watched their limbic systems light up under an fMRI. The feedback from monitor to mind to behavior was rapid and life improving, at least for some of the patients. Self-knowledge was power, and indeed this is a sense in which free will was literally regained. This leads more generally to my second point, neurobiology as liberation and free will as a progressive human goal rather than a matter of human nature. By understanding the wonders as well as the limits of our brains, by recognizing how we are easily duped and how easily we dupe ourselves, we have an opportunity to overcome much avoidable pain. What is especially exciting, I believe, is that in doing so, we can combine ancient wisdom and cutting edge knowledge. When it comes to understanding the brain, the partnership of the Dalai Lama and the MIT neuroscientists provide a wonderful service to us all. Buddhist meditation and philosophy, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim teachings on justice and ethics, and nuclear magnetic imaging will all play their role. As a social scientist, I am persuaded of a third point. Understanding human nature in its neuroscientific complexity will give us new tools for social life. We learn, for example, how our limbic system, our brain's fear and aggression center, is primed by hunger and deprivation. We learn how the inhibitory impulses of the cerebellum induce us to respond to physical pressures with greater force than we understand we are applying to others. Unwanted escalation can be, the, can be hardwired in certain circumstances in the pushing match at the bar that ends up in a death. We learn again and again in psychological studies how we are prone to magnify tiny human differences into great divides of us versus them. In all of these ways, we are not free at all, but gripped by unconscious forces that we need to understand in order to control. In his preface to my new book, Commonwealth, E.O. Wilson put the human predicament in the following way. As we grapple with our massive ecological and geopolitical challenges, Wilson note, noted that, quote, we exist in a bizarre combination of Stone Age emotions, medieval beliefs, and godlike technology. That, in a nutshell, is how we have lurched into the early 21st century, end quote. Or as he concluded consilience, and I quote again, is it worth asking repeatedly, it is worth asking repeatedly, where are our deepest roots? 
We are, it seems, old world catarine primates, brilliant emergent animals defined genetically by our unique origins, blessed by our newfound biological genius, and secure in our homeland if we wish to make it so." End quote. We are, I believe, most importantly, the progeny of a shared evolutionary path, all of us Africans, and now all of us citizens of a crowded, conflict-ridden, and environmentally threatened planet. We have an incredible capacity for reason and joy, but also for panic, fear, and aggression. And we are potentially free. Today's conference can help us on that quest. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. And uh, we have just a, a couple minutes uh, for, for a very short break. And um, we'll begin the next session just maybe a minute or two before 4. Thank you. And if they're standing and sit still if they're sitting just for a second. Uh, my name is Bob Pollock. I am, I learned today. Uh, for all my titles, they're irrelevant. What I really am is the guy who tells Jeff Sachs what to do. And you were among the first people to hear that. It's a shock to me, but I'm happy to learn it. Um, I am responsible for uh, introducing the speakers in the first session of this event, and therefore for setting precedent on how we do that. This is how we'll do that. The session is called Free Will in the Natural World. And uh, I, we have uh, three Columbia University professors, colleagues, and friends speaking. Uh, Darcy Kelly from the Biological Sciences Department, David Helfand from the Astrophysics Department, and Paul, Appleba Paul Applebaum from the School of Law and the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, I'd like to, to do it this way. Each of them has a time slot of 40 minutes. I know they won't go over. If they go under to any extent, we'll just have me introduce the next person. When we're done with all three, all four of us will come up and fill these seats. And we will then have time for a discussion amongst ourselves and with you by questions to microphones until we're scheduled to close this at 6.30. So uh, that said, that's to explain why even though there are four chairs, mics, and bottles of water, we're not going to be sitting up here until we're all three of us uh, introduced and done. And before I introduce Darcy as a first speaker, I, I want to give a, a brief response to what we've heard so far by way of introducing the notion of free will in the natural world, which is an interesting heading, actually, because it implies there are other places. Um, well, like the mental world, if it's not entirely natural. The question for today, in my mind, in this session is, how we understand the extremes of free will in the natural world. And uh, I will talk about the two ends of, of the extremes of the availability of free will in, in humans. Uh, at one end, the one I'd like to mention briefly, we have, as Jeff alluded to, and Paul did as well, we have the problem of people who are slaves and people who are mentally ill to the point where they cannot exercise their mental capacities in a, in a functional way. Uh, I'll save for the end of these brief remarks what we have at the other end of free will. And on the matter of slaves, I, I have little to say here, I'm afraid, except that slavery is wrong. But on the matter of, of a mental illness and madness, my friend Jay Nugaboren, a uh, Columbia College graduate uh, and novelist, uh, recently wrote a review of a book by Ellen Sachs called The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness. And in it, he quotes yet another Columbia person, our colleague Eric Kandel, Nobel laureate neurobiologist, who said when he began his residence in psychiatry 50 years ago that he, quote, sensed that psychoanalysis, talk therapy, could be immeasurably enriched by joining forces with biology. And that if the biology of the 20th century were to answer some of the enduring questions about the human mind, those answers would be richer and more meaningful if they were arrived at in collaboration with psychoanalysis. 
Eric then go, went on in his book to articulate the basis for this optimism. He says, quote, I believe then, and I believe more strongly now, that biology may be able to delineate the physical basis of several mental processes that lie at the heart of psychoanalysis, namely unconscious mental processes, psychic determinism, the fact that no action or behavior, no slip of the tongue is entirely random or arbitrary, the role of the unconscious in psychopathology, that is the linking of psychological events, even disparate ones, in the unconscious, and the therapeutic effect of talk psychoanalysis itself. What particularly fascinated me, he writes, because of my interest in the biology of memory, was the possibility that psychotherapy, which presumably works in part by creating an environment in which people learn to change, produces structural changes in the brain, and that one might now be in a position to evaluate these changes directly. Well, we are. But as Jay says in his review, Kandel's optimism remains just that, a hope for the future, since we cannot yet describe nor evaluate the structural changes he alludes to. So I think our session today and the larger purpose of the meeting is to ask what do we do and how will we remain free when these structural changes are well understood to the point where they may be predicted or in fact controlled. And in that sense, it's essential, I think, that we turn to those people who have a maximum of a functional free will in our society, that is to say, tenured professors in the sciences. <laughs> and that's why the first speaker is my friend and colleague and co-professor in the Frontiers of Science course at Columbia, Darcy Kelly. Darcy is professor of biological sciences. She has her AB from Barnard, her PhD from Rockefeller, where she came to, from, where, from whence she went to Princeton before coming here. She came in 1982 when I had been here only a few years, and she then co-founded the graduate program in neurobiology and behavior. She's been a scientific advisor to the Sloan Foundation and the Fairchild Foundation, and is currently a trustee of the Wenigren, Wenigren and Grass Foundations and editor of Developmental Neurobiology. Uh, I have known her therefore for 25 years, but recently I have come to understand her work, most importantly through her organization with David Helfand of the program Fr uh, Frontiers of Science, a required course of all first year students in Columbia College, a course in which I find myself immersed for an infinite amount of well-rewarded labor to teach 17-year-olds what science is and what it isn't. So having learned so much from Darcy, it's a pleasure to introduce her now. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank Bob for inviting me. Uh, like Jeffrey, I uh, was full, full of terror at the thought um, of actually giving this talk, but it turned out to be very enjoyable and I learned a lot. So that's what Bob's contribution is to our intellectual life. He encourages you to do things and think about problems that you wouldn't think about otherwise. Now, as you all know, I'm sure it is the duty of a tenured professor to begin by convincing you how important their field is. And then what you're supposed to do is go on and show how the most incredible advances in this field in the past few years have brought us to a new brink of understanding of the universe. So I'm very lucky in this regard. I don't have to convince you how important neuroscience is. The two previous speakers were good exemplars of that. I've never heard such accurate understanding of neuroscience come out of the mouth of a social scientist before in my entire life. <laughs> we must be doing something right or else he's the best student around. Um, but I do think I'd like to spend a little bit of time filling you in on why it is that the word neuroscience as opposed to evolutionary biology or genetics, all of whom are very important for this particular discussion, appears on your uh, program. 
And to do that, what I'd like to do is to give you a very brief history of how we've come to know something about the human brain, and particularly about volition. Um, planning actions in the human brain, which lies at the heart, I think, of the intersection between the topic that we're talking about today, which is free will, and the topic of how the brain works. So you're going to have to put up with me for a moment here in my professorial role. And uh, imagine yourself in the five-minute Frontiers of Science lecture. <laughs> at which I explain to you everything that you need to know to understand about the brain in order to talk about some interesting experiments that relate to free will. Um, and uh, the neurosciences, or neuroscience, which we tend to call it in general, is a multidisciplinary attack on the most complicated organ in the human body, which is shown here, which is the brain. Um, it actually is a very recent field. The first meeting of the Society for Neuroscience was here in New York City 32 years ago, and I remember that date because I was expecting my first child, and it was very hard to give a poster while hugely pregnant. Uh, he was born December 2nd, and the neuroscience meeting is in November, so uh, the date is burned in my memory. Um, and of course, all these fields existed beforehand. There were uh, psychologists and neurologists and biologists who studied the brain, but at some point, everybody came together and said, let's pool our resources. Let's see if we can't figure out some of the most fundamental things about the way nerve cells work and some of the most interesting things about the way uh, the whole brain works, particularly the human brain. So what did we know back there in 1975? So what we knew was, is shown here, which I probably don't have a pointer good enough. I'll use this. Okay. So what we knew was uh, the structures, the basic structures of the human brain. So this is a human head. Here's the nose, all right? And here's the spinal column going back on down. And we knew that the cortex is divided into a number of different regions, each of which seems to do something a little bit different. So this, for example, is the temporal region of the cortex. It's got auditory information. It's where um, the decoding of speech sounds takes place. This, all the way at the back of the brain, uh, is the occipital cortex, where visual information comes in. In front of it is the parietal cortex, and in front of that is the frontal cortex. Now, we knew a little bit about the frontal cortex. We know, knew that, for example, it encodes certain motor functions. But there was a region in the frontal cortex about which we knew almost nothing. And that's the reason that a region that I've outlined here in turquoise. That's the prefrontal cortex, which you now know more about, uh, thanks to Jeffrey Sachs, but which turns out to be a key region in human planning um, and also in human personality as I'll show you in a minute. We knew in 1975 almost nothing about prefrontal cortex. It was almost a complete void. And the only reason that it wasn't a complete void was that we had a very interesting case study to think about, a case study of a single individual who's probably one of the most famous patients in all of neuroscience. And that, of course, is the famous railroad man, Phineas Gage. And here you see a picture of his death mask, a, uh, a tradition which we have sadly given up. And here you see actually a picture of his skull, which is ensconced somewhere at Harvard, hidden away in the basement. And we have his skull because his family gave it to his doctor when he died. And it's a good thing we have it, as I'll show you in a minute. So Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage was a foreman of a crew of railroad construction workers who were excavating rocks, actually granite, to make way for a railroad track. This involved drilling holes deep into the boulders and filling them with dynamite. A fuse was then inserted in the entrance to the hole plugged with sand so that the force of the explosion could be directed into the boulder. This was done with a crowbar-like tool called the tamping iron. Plays a big role in this story. On the 13th of September, 1848, 25-year-old Gage and his crew were working on the Rutland and Burlington Railroad near Cavendish in Vermont. Gage was preparing for an explosion by compacting a bore with explosive powder using a tamping iron. While he was doing this, a spark from the tamping iron ignited the powder, causing the iron to be propelled at high speed straight through his skull. It entered under the left cheek, 
uh, bone and exited through the roof of the head and was recovered some 30 yards from the site of the accident. Needless to say, none of his coworkers expected him to survive, but he did, and so did the spike. So in addition to Phineas Gage's skull, Harvard also houses the spike, and you can see that it is no inconsiderable instrument for lesioning the brain. And you can see the hole in his skull, well you probably can't see it, but look at his left cheekbone, uh, which is to your right, um, that's where the spike went in, and then look at this hole on the top of the head, which is where the spike came out, okay? This actually turns out to be an important part of the story. Okay, so Gage was uh, taken care of by Dr. Harlow, and he recovered, but he did not go back to work, and this is why. His contractors, who regarded him as the most efficient and capable foreman in their employ previous to his injury, considered the change in his mind so marked that they could not give him his place again. And this is a quote from one of them. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, which was not previously his custom. Before this, he was a very uh, circumspect person. Manifesting but little deference for his fellows, impatient of restraint of advice when it conflicts with his desires, at times pertinaciously obstinate, yet capricious and vacillating, devising many plans of future operation which are no sooner arranged than they are abandoned in turn for others appearing more feasible. In this regard, his mind was radically changed, so decidedly that his friends and acquaintances said he was no longer Gage. Okay, and I'm going to return to this last sentence, which I think is the key to the whole issue. Um, but this does point out something that Jeffrey brought up, which is that lesions, damage to the human brain, are a major source of information for us and how the human brain works. As you know, we know a lot about the nervous system, but most of the details comes from experiments in animals. In humans, we must rely on natural experiments, the experiments of stroke, the experiments of uh, blood vessels bursting and this rather large-scale experiment of having a, a spike be driven through somebody's brain. Okay, so we, it's possible to reconstruct the part of the brain that the spike went through. So this is a picture of the spike here. Here it's entering in the left cheek, here it's going out the top of the head because placements of brain in the head are very predictable. And we can actually ask what part of Gage's brain was damaged. And we believe that it's a causal relationship because he was fine beforehand and he was a mess afterwards, okay? So it turns out the part that was damaged was that same turquoise part that you saw in the previous slide, the prefrontal cortex. So this is a side view of the human brain. This purple part is prefrontal. This is premotor and this is motor. So this whole thing is the frontal lobe. If you look at the brain from underneath, you can see how much of the underneath part of the brain, which we call the ventral part of the brain, is uh, turquoise and is prefrontal lobe. And here's a view from the middle. If the hemisphere was cut away, you're looking right at the middle. And you can see that that spike was driven almost entirely through the frontal lobe. And so for a very long time, everything that we knew about the function of the frontal lobe really was predicated on cases like Gage, and he was the best case. Um, recently, however, we've come to a more sophisticated understanding of the frontal lobe, none of which denies anything that we learned from Gage, but you yourself could look at his behavior and say, well, he doesn't seem to be able to restrain his impulses. Um, he uh, doesn't seem to be able to plan in any long-term way. Uh, and the uh, relationship of short-term and long-term reward to planning seems somehow disordered. And you could tell that just from the case study, and that's why neurologists like Oliver Sacks, who's now a member of our faculty, um, are such a good source of insight into the function of the, of the prefrontal cortex. So what do we think about the prefrontal cortex nowadays? So my colleague Bob Sapolsky, who's at Stanford, says this about prefrontal cortex. Um, on a certain metaphorical level, the prefrontal cortex is the closest thing we possess to a superego. It is the job of the prefrontal cortex to bias an individual towards doing the harder rather than the easier thing. And he's quoting a paper by Miller and Cohen, and I'll talk about Cohen again in a moment, who's at Princeton. So Polsky, you know, is the famous guy who wrote Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, one of the best science writers around. 
So the way we typically distill this, and it's an oversimplification, is that the prefrontal cortex, the job of the prefrontal cortex is something called executive function. And, uh, and the question is, what do we mean by executive function? And what is it that we think the prefrontal cortex does? So for a very up-to-date view, up view of the prefrontal cortex, I give you this hideously complicated diagram. And I learned in my reading on the prefrontal cortex that we could understand this diagram better if I explained to you what the boxes and the ovals are. So every box on this diagram is a part of the brain. So the red box is the prefrontal cortex. Um, down here you have the limbic system, including the amygdala that Jeffrey Sachs talked to you about, and the hypothalamus. Here you have the hippocampus, a structure intimately involved in learning and memory. Um, over here you have the anterior cingulate cortex. This is a fascinating area of the brain. It lights up at the onset of romantic love and also lights up for parental love. Um, and so those are the boxes, and then the ovals are functions or inputs to the prefrontal cortex. So there's a perceptual input and outflow, there's memory, there's emotion and drive, and then most importantly, there's the selection of a form of action which goes through these premotor areas. So the prefrontal cortex itself is thought of as being involved in concept and strategy. It's a modulatory gate in the sense that it, it plays a role in the decisions of actions. And it's really importantly involved in integrating emotion with action and with planning. OK, where does a diagram like this come from? You think, oh my god, they understand it so beautifully. 2008, physiological reviews, and I'll never understand this diagram. This diagram is the result of experiments, all right? And I'm going to show you a couple of experiments because they're the bread and butter of how we understand the brain. And particularly, I'm going to show you how we can watch the human brain at work for a few minutes using functional magnetic resonance imaging, how it works. Okay? It's not that hard to understand, and it's the basis of pretty much everything we know about the human brain. So to do that, I'll have to tell you a teeny bit about the brain, and then we'll go back to the cool experiments about the brain gone bad, okay? So this is a picture of the human cortex. Um, it's got two kajillion cells, more than you can even imagine. But the structure of the cortex is exactly the same. So I'm going to play a little movie, and we're going to see a slab of the cortex come out. And for a brief moment, you're going to see all the cells that are in that slab, at least on the surface of the slab. With any luck, this will play. I don't know, it got cathected on those Galapagos marine iguanas and doesn't want to go on in my talk. Hold on, let me get in here. All right, well, forget about the slab. It, it, it expressed its free will by refusing to play the movie. So if we pull a slab of the brain out and take a look at it, we see all these tiny, tiny gray dots. And what those are are the cells that make up the brain, the neurons or the nerve cells. Now you can't see them with your eye because they're too small. They're 10 or 20 micrometers across. A millimeter, which you can visualize, is that smallest thing on one of those metric rulers, OK, is 1,000 micrometers. So they're a hundredth of that, and you just can't see them with your eye. So you have to see them with a microscope. But when you look at them with a microscope, what you see is that they have a structure that's devoted to the processing of information. So information comes in here, um, and information travels from one nerve cell to the other, down this space here, and nerve cells communicate at synapses, which is also something that Jeffrey mentioned. So the way that information travels is electrical. There's an electrical signal that travels down. There's a chemical released at the end of this uh, part of the cell. And then the next cells produce an electrical signal. And that electrical signal is called the action potential. OK? 
So this product, that's how you think, by the way. <laughs> that's how you listen inside of your brain, right at this moment. Two kajillion action potentials in different parts of your brain. If I were to say something surprising and shocking or show you a scary picture, there'd be action potentials in your prefrontal cortex, right? If I said something deeply boring, everything would shut down, your reticular formation would come on, and you'll have a lovely snooze. Now, <laughs> It's a cell, right? The nerve cell is a cell. It needs energy and oxygen to work. And in fact, the brain is an incredibly oxygen-hungry organ. So it weighs only three pounds. It's only 2% of the total body weight, but it gets 10% of the blood flow and 20% of oxygen consumption. And that's because your brain works. So, you know, when your mother says, you know, you have to eat carrots or something to feed your brain, she's right. She's absolutely right. Those nerve cells require glucose and oxygen in order to work. So what that means is, here's a nerve cell, here's the blood flowing nearby it, here's the oxygen that it needs, this is the green ball, okay? And the oxygen in the blood is coupled to another uh, molecule called hemoglobin. And so when you get action potentials, one or lots, the blood vessels actually get larger and you get a lot more oxygen and a lot more hemoglobin. And what this means is that if you get more blood flow in a region, it means there are a lot of action potentials there. That's the part of the brain that's working. And that's the actual conceptual basis of functional magnetic resonance imaging. You're really looking at a signal that's derived from blood flow. And you can look at this signal because an increase in blood flow changes the ratio of hemoglobin that has oxygen attached to it, that's this yellow ball and this, and this green ball, to the ratio of uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin, which is the hemoglobin that's lost its oxygen because it's gone into the nerve cell to help it to work. And the point of this is, is that the magnetic signals from these two things are different. So you can tell a part of the brain that's working by the ratio of the different kinds of hemoglobin. Do they have their oxygen? Hey, it's not working so hard. Have they had to give up their oxygen because nerve cells need it? It's working much harder. And it, that's the actual basis of functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's called the bold signal, the blood oxygen level determination. Okay. So that's how it works, but what does it look like? So here is our beloved professor Donald Hood in the psychology department, and he is about to be slid in to the scanner that's uptown at the medical school that's operated by our colleague Joy Hirsch. And what, what Don's doing here is he's gonna show you what part of the brain is responsible for visual stimulation. And the way you run these experiments is you provide a stimulus, in this case it's a checkerboard, and then you have a control, no visual stimulus, and you, can, you subtract the activity during the control from the stimulus, and that tells you what's going on. So what do you get out? You get out a picture of the parts of the brain that are working. So here's a guy's head, here's a slice of the brain. See a slice, here's the nose, here's the back. So here's that slice of the brain. And all the activity is at the back here of the brain. And we already know what that was. That was the occipital lobe, it's involved in vision. And the way you do it mechanically is you actually measure in every little single bit of brain tissue in a unit called a voxel, the difference between no visual stimulus and a visual stimulus, and you subtract the blue line from the black line. That's the basis of the technique. It's, um, it's cool, it's beyond cool, <laughs> but it's a subtractive technique. So you can, so, so just imagine what this is. You can watch the human brain at work. This is a real advance. We never could do this before. It's non-invasive, sort of. The magnets are really loud, but you're not sticking something in anybody's brain. You're not pulling out part of the brain. You're not putting an electrode. You can actually watch nerve cells at work. Okay, now we're gonna do an experiment. We're now going to talk about how we would use this method to figure out what the prefrontal cortex does. And this is actually an experiment that was done by our colleague in psychology, Kevin Oshner, when he was at Stanford. And this is a really interesting experiment that I think gives you some insight into the prefrontal cortex. So what Kevin did was he had the guy in the scanner and he gave him two images. One image, what would you characterize this image as? Benign, neutral, I call it scary myself. I call this a scary image. 
Okay, so he gave them a very high emotional value image, and you can check how emotional it is. And for the control task, he gave a neutral image. This is actually something I got in the web on constructing face recognition. So what he, and in the first part of the experiment, he said to the person who was in the scanner, I just want you to pay close attention to what you're seeing. Feel anything you want to feel. Just let your emotions watch, wash over you, but pay close attention. So that's the instruction to attend. In the next part of the experiment, what he said to the subject was, I know you're, you, there are some of these images that might make you feel something, but I want you to cancel out that feeling. I want you to reappraise it. I want you to suppress that feeling and view this image in as neutral a way as you can. And some of these were very disturbing images. They were amputations and so forth. So he gave, a he gave an instruction. So the first thing you might ask is, I would ask, oh, come on, can they actually do this? And it turns out they can do it. It's kind of interesting. So these are the data. So what this is is the strength of the negative uh, effect. And he can ask them or he can look at their eye blink, right? So he can have a self-report. And if they're just letting the emotions wash over themselves, the strength here on this scale is 3.5. But when they try to suppress their emotions here in the reappraisal, they manage to suppress that very negative thing. And it's uh, still a bit higher than it would be to a neutral stimulus, but they've brought it way down. Okay, now what he wants to know is, if you go and look at the brain, what parts of the brain are different when they're paying attention to this, to this stimulus, but just letting themselves feel whatever they want, and when they're actively trying to control their emotions? which, as you'll recall, is one of the things the prefrontal cortex does. So here's the summary of the results. This has a couple interesting things. So this is a side view of the brain. So we're looking at the right-hand side of somebody's brain, and we're looking at the left-hand side. And like many features of the brain, you get more activation on one side than the other. And this whole thing, this area all the way around here, is the prefrontal cortex. And so there are areas in the prefrontal cortex that are selectively engaged when you actually have to, that's what the green is, when you actually have to suppress an emotion, okay? So this is the kind of experiment that gave rise to one of the diagram, one of the arrows on the diagram, the two-way street between the prefrontal cortex and emotion, okay? And this, and this is, of course, not the only experiment, that, but there are many experiments. So if you all want to know where a diagram like this comes from, it comes from a study like Kevin did when he was at Stanford. Okay, so as my mother would say, I tell you all this for a reason. <laughs> and, the reason that I, and the reason that I tell you this is because these kinds of techniques, the functional magnetic resonance imaging techniques, are being used more and more frequently in legal cases, particularly in death penalty cases. Um, and uh, let me just go through the reason why this might be the case, because it has to do centrally, I think, with the notion of free will, which is embedded within our legal system. So our legal system uh, wishes to ascertain uh, whether somebody is innocent or guilty of a crime. That's problem number one, right? I mean, you know, there are degrees of innocent and guilt, but no, it's innocent or guilty. That's what the, that's what the, the uh, jury has to decide. But our legal system recognizes that there are conditions or people in which the absolute responsibility for the commission of an act uh, has a condition of diminished responsibility. So what are those? Well, some of them are pretty obvious. So for example, if you have an epileptic fit and your hand flies out and you hit somebody, the chances of your being convicted for aggravated assault are extremely low. Okay? You were in the midst of a fit. You didn't even know you hit them, right? That's a neurological disorder. We also recognize that there are periods in time in the lifetime of human beings when, in fact, their notion of the consequences of their actions is not completely developed. So children, for example, are not held to the same standards of guilt and innocence, and certainly not to the same standards of punishment, little children anyway, um, as adults. And finally, and this is most recently and most germane, there's madness. If while you're hacking off the neck of a person, you think you're cutting a loaf of bread, the law recognizes that you are not in a, in a completely competent state, that you have diminished responsibility. 
And that concept of madness, what's now called the insanity defense, uh, has been codified in something called the McNaughton Doctrine, which actually dates back to the assassination of the British Prime Minister Peel and was codified thereafter. And the idea behind the McNaughton doc Doctrine is that if you have somebody who's insensible of the concept of right and wrong, they cannot be held totally uh, responsible for their actions. Now, in the United States until the 1980s, actually until Hinckley tried to assassinate Reagan, there was an addition, ex additional exculpatory element. And that was the element of the control of volition. So until the 1980s, until there was a huge furor um, when Hinckley was acquitted of a, the assassination by reason of insanity, right? Uh, it was felt that there were people who recognized the difference between right and wrong, but couldn't help doing what they did. They had very poor control of their impulses. Their volitional control was compromised. After the 1980s, part, because of this, in large part because of this, this kind of uh, exculpatory defense has been practically annihilated. But it resurfaces again and again in the arguments of neuroscientists because, in point of fact, most of our understanding of the prefrontal cortex indicates that the control of volition has as strong a biological basis as madness, as childhood, or as epilepsy. And in fact, the field of neuroscience does not now currently make distinctions between psychological ailments and neurological ailments. They're both functions of the brain. And there's a very nice paper, this Green and Cohen paper. There's a whole issue of the Proceedings of the Royal Society devoted to this. Okay, that's the idea. What's the experiment? Okay, we're scientists, we want to do an experiment. And this is a recent, very important experiment that speaks to the function of the prefrontal cortex in moral judgments. Um, so it's a, a, a experiment. I actually put up all the names here because I long to be called Fiery Cushman. <laughs> I know Mark Hauser and I know Ralph Adolson, Tony Damasio, but I don't know this Fiery Cushman person. What a great name. <laughs> okay, so let me describe to you this experiment. Uh, I'm going to tell you two, about two experiments, the last two things I'm going to tell you, uh, but it's a very interesting one. So what uh, Connix et al. did was they found six brain damaged patients that had damage to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. You remember I told you the turquoise part was bigger on the bottom? So here's the bottom of the brain. And this is the, the redder it is, the more commonality there is in the damage to this part of the brain. So they got six brain damaged people to a specific area of the brain. And first they wanted to know how they were, how were they functioning. And it was actually kind of interesting. What they did was they showed them scary faces and they uh, measured their galvanic skin response. You remember that thing, it's the thing that's used in the uh, lie detector test. And they all had impaired galvanic skin responses. They didn't feel fearful. And then they gave them a test. Did they feel empathy? Did they feel embarrassment? Did they feel guilt? And a normal subject would have a score of zero here. And they, none of them had zeros. There was one that wasn't too bad, this guy right in here, but everybody else was impaired um, in their empathy, their embarrassment, and their guilt. And then they gave them the famous trolley problem. <laughs> this is the famous moral dilemma. Now, I'm, I apologize for the picture, and if anybody has a better one, please send it to me. But let me tell you what the idea is. You say to your subject, you say, okay, you are standing here next to a track, and a runaway trolley is coming down, and you have your hand on the switch. If you switch it this way, you'll kill one person. If you switch it this way, you'll kill five people. What do you do? Okay, that's the trolley problem, okay? Then there's a variant of the trolley problem. In this variant of the trolley problem, in order to have to stop the trolley, what you have to do is actually throw this poor person in front of the trolley. How that works, I have no idea. But anyway, that's the idea. So you actually have to reach out and throw the person in front of the trolley, okay? And what they did was they asked of their, uh, of their prefrontal damage subjects, of, they had brain damage controls, and of their normal subjects, how much of you would endorse either throwing the switch or throwing the guy in front of the switch? So they gave them this test on, de on de decisions that had no moral component, that weren't the trolley problem. 
They gave them on the top trolley problem, which we call the impersonal one. You just throw in a switch. You don't have to touch anybody, right? And they gave it to the trolley person on the personal problem. You, not only do you have to touch somebody, but you have to throw somebody, at least mentally, in front of the thing. And where they came up with the biggest difference is between the groups was that these people with prefrontal damage had a lot less trouble throwing the person in front of the trolley than the pe normally brain damage controls, OK? Well, did this mean they were somehow defective in their decision making? And so they actually ran, they looked at their data much more carefully and they decided, they didn't just give them their trolley problem, they gave them a whole lot. And they decided they had two kinds of moral dilemmas. They had low conflict ones. Would you abandon your baby in an orphanage if you couldn't take care of it anymore? Versus would you suffocate your baby with a pillow if you couldn't take care of it anymore? So the first one is low conflict and the second one is high conflict. And the, on the low conflict ones, they didn't get any difference at all, as you can see here, between their prefrontally damaged group, their brain, other brain damaged group, and their controls. But on this high conflict problem, these guys have really a lot of trouble. And they, they testify to this uh, truism of Sapolsky is that it's the job of the prefrontal cortex to do the harder thing rather than the easier thing. This is a harder, th harder thing they're doing that. Now you might think that maybe these people are just utilitarian, right? Maybe they've lost all affect. Maybe they're just cold machines and robots and can't feel any emotion at all. And interestingly enough, these same guys tested these same brain damaged people in another test that revealed that not only were they not cold, but they were actually incredibly emotional. And they tested them on something called the ultimate game. <laughs> so the ultimate game is this, all right? I figured out how much. Oh, yeah, OK. So $20. I give you $20. You're A. You can give part of it to B, OK? If B accepts what you give them, you both get some money, OK? If B doesn't accept it, you don't get any money at all, OK? And what you vary in the ultimate game is the amount of money that the A offers to B. And at some point, usually 20% of the total, B says, ah, you're insulting me. What a low offer. I don't have to take it. It's a completely irrational decision, right? Because when B says no, nobody gets anything, right? It's not even utilitarian. No money is given out at all, OK? But at some point, you just feel the offer isn't worth your time. <laughs> Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is uh, one of the mainstays currently of neuroeconomics, right? Okay, well, these guys, so this is the percent of people that accepted it. B, if it was five bucks, they all took it. If it was four bucks, they all took it. They started to kind of become scuzzy around the edges at three bucks. By the time they were down to two bucks and one bucks, only about 30% of the guys took the money, even though they knew rationally, right? They wouldn't get anything otherwise. But look at our ventral premotor cortex damaged person. They say, the hell with you. You have insulted me. They become incredibly angry over this insult. Uh, the, any consideration of rationality of any sort whatsoever is lost. So they're not cool, calm, and calculating. They're just as emotional as anybody else. So what does this mean in terms of the way we think about the law? And there's a, I, I refer you to their paper where they argue it much more cleanly than I do. This Green and Cohen paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society is very interesting. And what they say is, look, if this is an area of the brain that's involved in impulse control, which it clearly is, it shouldn't actually matter whether you can tell right from wrong. And the famous example here is, did you ever hear the example of the guy who stole cars? It's a very cute example. It's in the Lancet. Uh, so there was this guy. He was fine. He worked in a, he was a mechanic in a, in a car dealership. And he had an aneurysm, a blown blood vessel in his brain. And he recovered eventually. But he couldn't do mechanics anymore. Put him in the office. And what he started doing was taking the cars from the car lot. And he took up to 100 cars. And he'd just leave them in the neighborhood all over the place. And of course, he was arrested and put into jail. And this happened over and over and over and over again. And when you talked to him, he said he knew it was wrong but he just had to do it, OK? So this is the basis of the current legal fracas over it. And this guy had damage to this part of his brain, right? And he did. He could tell right from wrong. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but he had very poor impulse control. What is it that we should do about this person? Clearly, locking them up is not going to help his impulse control, that's for sure. Um, so uh, Green and Cohen make the argument, which I must say I buy, that we have to think about diminished responsibility in a different way because of our current understanding 
understanding of neuroscience. That the, that the notion that it's not him, it's his brain, is basically a completely false notion because he is his brain. There is no me that isn't my brain, nor you that isn't your brain. Every aspect of ourselves, every experience in our lives has imprinted itself on our nervous system, and everything that we do and every reaction that we get is also reflected in our brain. It's not like there's something outside of our brain. And if our brain goes south, our behavior goes south, you have to ask the question of how that maps onto it. Now, you can say to me, and my, I hope my students would say to me, how do you know you are your brain? And of course, you know, it's a difficult and complicated issue, but there's a very simple experiment that I think lends some credence to it. If you are your brain, your, the brain activity that happens when somebody who has an auditory hallucination, who hears voices, should be exactly the same as the brain activity when that person's actually hearing somebody speak, right? So luckily for all of us, this experiment has been done. Um, let me just show you what the experiment consists of. So what you do is you play something into the brain One with the morning, FMRI. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. <laughs> so you play him something like Groucho Marx. One night I found an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. Okay, that engages actually both the auditory cortex, which is here on the left side of the brain, and the front part of the brain. And then you ask, is this activity the same or different from when somebody's having an auditory hallucination? Okay, so here are the guys in this study. There are five in this study. It was in Switzerland. And here's a guy hearing speech. Here's the signal. He's hearing reverse speech. This is real speech. This is reverse speech. This is a tone. This is the control. And here's the activity in his brain, right here in the same spot on the left-hand side of the brain when he self-reports hearing voices. Okay, so the guy is hearing voices. There may not be a voice, but he's hearing voices. His brain is saying that he's hearing voices. And you know, I happen to think this is actually a really reasonably powerful uh, thought. So a statement like this, which I found on the web in a marvelous site that's devoted to having you improve <laughs> your uh, physical skills so that you can win games, says your brain controls all your thoughts, actions, and emotions. I happen to disagree with this. Your brain is your thoughts. The activity of your brain are your thoughts. They are your emotions. They do control your actions because in order to move, you have to have information go out and access the muscles. So the question, if we come back to this last question about that his friends asked about Phineas Gage, that he was no longer Gage, that's not true. It wasn't that he was no longer Gage. He was still Gage. He was just a different Gage. He, he was his, he was, in the same sense, Gage, as he was when he was Gage the boy, right? Because his brain as a boy was different than his brain after the damage. So the essence of yourself, most neuroscientists believe, is your brain. And so to say that somebody is no longer themselves is not what we would regard as a statement that jives with most of what we know about neuroscience. And I actually would like to, uh, to uh, dedicate this talk to Phineas Gage. If you go to Cavendish, Vermont, you will see this lovely memorial to Gage with a picture of the poor soul of the spike. Luckily, it didn't actually have a pointed end. Um, that was an Australian artist who did it. But it turns out that much of what we learned about the prefrontal cortex, even before modern science, really came about because of Gage. Thank you. Early undergraduate courses for non-science majors, including one of his own design, which treats the atom as a tool for revealing the quantitative history of everything, from human diet and works of art to the Earth's climate and the universe. He also recently implemented a vision he began working on in 1982. I dare say I prodded him then as Dean of Columbia College. He began working on in 1982 that has all Columbia freshmen taking a science course as part of Columbia's famed core curriculum. He received the 2001 Presidential Teaching Award, the 2002 Great Teacher Award from the Society of Columbia Graduates. And several years ago, he began appearing weekly on the Discovery Channel's program Science News, bringing the latest astronomical discoveries to television audiences in the United States. More recently, his television appearances have been limited to more serious matters on Comedy Central's The Daily Show. Last fall, he helped launch Quest University in British Columbia, a highly innovative liberal arts and sciences university for undergraduates. 
He serves on, his words, far too many university, government, and American Astronomical Society committees for his own or anyone else's good. He believes he is a better cook than astronomer, and ambiguously, most of his colleagues who have sampled his gastronomical undertakings agree. He is a good cook. He's also a great teacher and a good scientist as well. David Helfand, thank you. I have only one correction to the earlier part of Bob's introduction, and that is I am not a tenured faculty member at Columbia. And that may perhaps explain why my appearance this afternoon represents a spectacular failure of free will. Uh, when I was first invited to participate in this, this, this symposium, I declined on the, to me, very rational grounds that I had nothing intelligent to say on the subject. Nonetheless, the organizers persisted. And I guess in the miasma of email one deals with every day, I at one point must have relented. Later, however, I was script to present for the proceedings, and I had another opportunity to demure because I have never in my life written out a talk, let alone read one, and you'll see the consequences of that, I fear, today. Uh, but I failed again. So here I am. The only saving grace is that I got back from Arizona at 1 o'clock in the morning and only began working on this this morning, uh, and as a consequence, I'll only waste 20 minutes of your time instead of the allotted 40 minutes. I should perhaps begin by explaining my title, which seems a little peculiar. In fact, it's taken from a line in Tom Stoppard's latest play, Rock and Roll. This play features a Cambridge Don, a British gentleman of some years, who's an unreconstructed communist. And he is in the process of defending the Soviets to a young Czech graduate student he has during the Prague Spring in 1968. And when the somewhat confused young man attempts to defend the actions of the new uh, Czech government while attempting to maintain his fealty to the communist ideals, uh, the Cambridge Don thunders at him, you're not a heretic, you're a pagan. Well, from my first days in college in that same year, 1968, that's what I always feel like in discussions of free will, a pagan. I basically don't get the point. I suppose this may have something to do with the fact that my philosophy of life is the examined life is not worth living. <laughs> and you can verify that with my wife if you want, she'd uh, agree. But it must also have something to do with my scientific outlook on the world. The cosmologist Ted Harrison divides the broad history of human models for the universe into three main categories, the anthropomorphic, the anthropocentric, and the anthropometric. The anthropomorphic universe is a universe of magic. It's a universe in which there is no division between the self and the external forces of nature. Some of this survives in our language. We speak of angry storms and gentle breezes as though these forces of nature were invested with the human emotions that we actually feel. This anthropomorphic view is what we imagine prehistory to have been like, although pockets of it, of course, still persist in places like Southern California and university English departments. The anthropocentric universe is the age of myth. Here we have created a pantheon of powerful gods who control these forces of nature, so we have an explanation for them. Uh, but of course, these gods are driven by human emotions and obsessed by human concerns. The anthropocentric universe is very fundamentally an Earth-centered universe, and regretfully, I think it's the universe which most people occupy today. The anthropometric universe is not as Protagoras would have it that man is the measure of all things, uh, but that he can perhaps take their measure and from that gain some perspective on his place in the universe. This is a story that began when Copernicus removed the Earth from the center of the universe and has continued over the last 400 years, developing what we call Western science. Clearly, I subscribe to the latter view that there exists an objective material universe consisting of space, time, matter, and energy, that we are fully, and I underscore fully, part of this materialistic universe, and that our brains, having evolved an adaptive capacity of considerable power in the service of the reproduction of our species, can in their spare time be put to work understanding this universe. 
But I think part of my difficulty with concepts such as free will, and religion for that matter, which I regard as falling within the same domain, lies in my definition of what the anthropometric mind is seeking to accomplish. I do not believe that science represents a quest for truth, that is truth with a capital T. Mathematicians have designed, and I emphasize they have not discovered, but designed a system of logic that can seek truth within that system. Mathematics has turned out to be extremely useful for modeling the physical universe, the thing in which I'm interested, and so is often envisioned as somehow wrapped up with science. But it is a fundamentally different pursuit. At this meeting in Arizona I just got back from, I got in a little dust up with Paul Davies, a winner of one of the first Templeton Prizes, when he repeatedly presented mathematics as something we have discovered and science as our quest to, quote, uncover the scheme, end quote, behind the layout of the universe. In my view, science is not about revelation. Science is about building models. It makes progress not by proving them true, but by falsifying them, replacing them with better models. Over the last 400 years, I would submit that science has a pretty good track record with that approach, with an ever-increasing ambit and ever greater explanatory power. Now, philosophers, I am told, also seek truth, but I confess, having never gotten to the end of a philosophical treatise, I cannot confirm they have ever succeeded. If they did, I suppose it would lead to mass unemployment uh, amongst the philosophical community, so perhaps there's a powerful driver uh, behind keeping this subject alive for another few thousand years. Uh, to illustrate how deeply pagan I am and how divergent from the interests of the vast majority of this audience, who I presume are here because they're interested in probing deeply the concept of free will, I will confess that I cannot understand why philosophers dream up this stuff to worry about. I see it as largely an uninteresting byproduct of our impressive analytical abilities coupled with too much free time. Sort of like, <laughs> sort of like Sudoku puzzles. <laughs> Now, having revealed myself as a genuine heathen, let me attempt to offer a modest contribution to the discussion of the next two days from my perspective as a physical scientist. Many of the speakers at this symposium, having been both more organized and more scholarly than I, have generously shared their remarks in advance with their fellow speakers, so I know something of what's coming in the next two days. It seems that determinism and quantum mechanical departures therefrom uh, form one of the major themes. And determinism in this context seems often to be associated with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Now, I will eschew a pop psychological analysis of why 15-something academics harken back to this sharply remembered and unexpected feature of their youth in attempting to render absurd a deterministic model. Suffice it to say, the argument usually goes, determinism means that the assassination of President Kennedy was foreordained by the precise locations and velocities of all of the particles in the universe when the universe was only one second old. This would exculpate Lee Harvey Oswald for pulling the trigger. Since this is morally offensive, a deterministic universe is unacceptable. Now, it turns out that we do know a lot about the universe when it was only one second old. Indeed, we know a lot about the universe when it was only about a millionth of a second old. And next year, when the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, in Europe, is turned on, it will recreate the conditions of the universe as it was when it was only one trillionth of a second old. I must caution you that yesterday's New York Times article, notwithstanding the Large Hadron Collider, will not produce a black hole that eats the Earth. Because indeed, if these conditions produced such black holes, we wouldn't be here to discuss it. Uh, because the universe would not have come into being. So not to worry. Now when I say we know these conditions at these early times, I mean we know physically meaningful quantities, like the temperature of the universe, the ratio of the number of neutrinos to photons, the number of photons to the number of quarks, the fraction of quarks in each family, etc. But let me step back, since this is not undoubtedly a philosophically attuned audience, I suppose I should be more careful with my words. We don't know these quantities. We have a model from which we can infer estimates of these quantities. That's what a scientist should say. Now this model has been developed over the last 60 years or so based on our observations of the universe. Direct observations can, in principle, take us only back to 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We can, in principle, only see that far back because of conditions I could explain later if you wish. But the image of the universe at that time, when it was 380,000 years old, which was refined with greater precision every month as observations continue, 
and a variety of other observations, such as the ratio of heavy hydrogen to normal hydrogen, allow us to make predictions of the earlier conditions, or infer the earlier conditions, and make predictions about what future observations might reveal. This is what I regard as science. Now, does my detailed knowledge of the earliest moments of the universe lead me to determinism? Absolutely not. I can predict the ratio of hydrogen to deuterium from my model, and then I can go out and measure that ratio, a challenging but, as of now, tractable undertaking. I cannot, however, and never will, be able to predict the assassination of anyone from my model, and I find it an absurd notion to think that one could. There are at least two reasons for this. One is that prediction implies to a scientist calculating an expected outcome. There are 10 to the 78th particles in the universe, each of which has three associated numbers marking its position in three-dimensional space, three associated numbers marking its velocity at that location, and several other numbers representing its quantum state. Each of these numbers would need to be following time sets shorter than a picosecond over 13.73 billion years to predict a shooting. This is demonstrably undoable even with a computer containing all of the atoms in our space-time. I could not even do the unimaginably simpler problem of calculating the birthplace and the birth date of our sun. And indeed, I find no conceivable reason of interest to do so. I can measure the age of the sun. I know how it works. I can predict the death of the sun to a fractional accuracy far better than I can predict the death of myself. But for me, there is no conceivable interest to calculate its birth from first principles. So for me, this practical impossibility renders, renders the question of determinism uninteresting. This lack of interest in unknowable things is probably explained by my earlier cited philosophy and also explains my irreligiousness. Now the second reason I can't predict Kennedy's assassination, and it's an independent reason of the first, from the conditions shortly after the Big Bang, is the fundamentally probabilistic nature of matter at the atomic scale. Einstein's objections to God not playing craps uh, notwithstanding, quantum mechanics is the most precise physical model we have ever invented. And it mandates an inherent randomness in the behavior of subatomic particles that makes deterministic predictions at this level impossible. Given the conditions in the first millionth of a second of the universe, these indeterminate interactions were dominant. However, I hesitate even to raise the specter of the quantum uncertainty, lest it serve as the crutch to avoid a materialistic, rational inquiry into the brain and its manifestation, the human mind. Much of the very little, I confess, I have read on this subject grasps at quantum mechanics as the scientific justification for free will. This, in my view, is arrant nonsense. Or to be slightly more generous, this is statistically unjustifiable in terms of our current physical models for the behavior of the atoms which compose the brain. Thus, the thermal velocity of molecules in our brain is roughly 250 meters per second, and the interaction scale is about 10 to the minus 9 meters. This amounts to over 100 billion interactions per second, 100 billion being roughly the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. While any one such interaction has an associated quantum uncertainty, a molecule might come along and rather than bouncing off a molecule, pass right through it and appear through quantum tunneling on the other side, the statistical distribution of these interactions is perfectly well defined. Multiplying by the 100 billion molecules per neuron and the 100 billion neurons in the brain, there is no quantum mechanical uncertainty involved. You need not worry about all your brain molecules simultaneously tunneling through your skull and ending up in your lap. If that happens to anyone during this meeting, I want to know about it. <laughs> Quantum mechanics, in my view, is irrelevant to discussions of free will. It did occur to me there was one statement a physicist could positively make about free will based on the models of reality we currently hold. Tachyons do not have free will. Tachyons are particles invented by my late colleague uh, Gary Feinberg in the physics department here, and their salient property is that they fat travel faster than the speed of light through empty space. Contrary to much popular science writing, the existence of such particles is not forbidden by relativity. The properties of faster-than-light travel, however, are well-defined in that model. 
And it is not difficult to show that if anything does travel faster than the speed of light, one is required to accept the situation in which the window back there breaks before the kid who threw the tachyon rock through it was born. Now, for a tachyon, the past unfolds before it. So it is very difficult to see how a tachyon could have free will. However, since tachyons have never been discovered, one might well dismiss this as an academic point. In the metaphysical discussion of free will I have been reading recently, I've encountered terms such as robust responsibility and inherent morality. I find these terms disturbing, as I do all anti-materialist and anti-rational arguments about subjects such as free will and religion. Insisting on transcendent non-physical properties of humans divorces us from the tree of life and of our, to me, inspiring and deep connections with the rest of the cosmos. It seems to me that to return to Harrison's epochs of human understanding, and this is the essence of my cosmic view, we seek meaning, meaning, when we lack understanding. The anthropomorphic caveman view of the storm is that the wind is blowing because the air is angry, or of the anthropocentric pagan because the wind god decreed it, because the wind god is angry. But once we have a model of air molecules and atmospheric pressure gradients, we can abandon this anthropomorphic explanation of the wind. The wind has no metaphysical meaning. It is a natural phenomenon explicable in the context of widely applicable physical models for matter and energy, models that our brains have created. Once we have these predictive models, we no longer feel the need to imbue the wind with meaning. As I believe Dave Krantz will discuss tomorrow morning, our models for the human brain are considerably less well-developed than the thermodynamics of air. It should perhaps not be surprising, then, that we seek meaning in the operation of the brain. Unsurprising, but worth, in my view, resisting. There was an article in yesterday's paper, another article, not about black holes, but about a couple whose three teenage children had been removed from their parents' care after their younger sibling had died from undiagnosed diabetes. The parents, it turned out, believed prayer for their child's recovery was preferable to taking her to a doctor. 2,000 years ago, this would have been a totally rational expectation, and given the state of medical knowledge at the time, probably equally efficacious. Today, we consider it criminal. Most people do not consider it acceptable for these parents to create their own reality in which mantras are preferable to medicine in caring for a child. In this instance, some would blame religious blindness, uh, although others find this a very difficult moral issue. For the latter group, I must ask you, what do you mean by moral? From whence does your moral model spring? It should be noted here that the postmodernist conceit of individually constructed realities is little different from the views of these parents. To give a more trivial example, I had a student some years ago who was having difficulty in my class and came to my office uh, for office hours for help. At the time, I was actually explaining the phases of the moon. Now, explaining the phases of the moon is sort of a hopeless task because most people come to a class with a model for why there are phases of the moon. It's because the Earth casts this varying shadow on the moon as the moon goes around. Well, that model is wrong, but nonetheless, most people cling to it even after having gotten an A in my class and answered correctly the questions about why the moon actually has phases. And so they recognize that for some brief moment of time, they must suspend their deep belief in why the moon has phases and just to please me, go with my explanation. And so they try to understand this. After an hour of me holding my basketball and having the tennis ball go around and having the student be the sun, I finally asked the question, and so when is the waning crescent moon high in the sky? And she answered, to my delight, at 9 o'clock in the morning. But then she said, oh, but that can't be right. And I said, why is that? And she said, because the moon's not up in the daytime. And I said, oh, yeah, and the moon is sometimes up in the daytime. You might not notice it because the sky's brighter, but the moon is up in the daytime. And she said, no, the moon's not up in the daytime. <laughs> and I said, well, look, tomorrow morning, actually, about 10 o'clock, come to my office, we'll find out the window, and I'll show you the moon in the daytime. And her response was, I don't have to. I know the moon is not up in the daytime. <laughs> now, you giggle or you gasp at that, but why? 
because you've seen the moon up in the daytime and therefore you know, in quotes, that it's there. Well, you've seen some stars up in the sky at night and I can assure you they're no longer there because they've exploded and disappeared. The light has been traveling to you for a long time and that signal has not reached you yet. Uh, but the point is that she hasn't seen the moon in the daytime and so it is consistent with her worldview, her cosmology, that the moon is only up at night. And furthermore, the model I am therefore trying to sell her with my basketball and my tennis ball must be wrong because it predicts the moon would be up in the daytime. Now, most of you may prefer my model to hers, but why do you? I trust it's not appeal to authority. Oh, well, he's an astronomer, so he should know something about the moon, so I'll believe him. That's a terrible reason. Is it because my model is predictive and consistent with the tests of its predictions? You might not have carried them out, but let's pretend you have. If so, that's good. But then my question to you is, why not apply the same rational rigor to examining questions of morality? Why fly to untested and untestable abstractions like free will to use as a basis for assigning moral responsibility, as we've just heard our courts sometimes do. Keith Stanovich, who's an evolutionary psychologist at the University of Toronto, in his book The Robot's Rebellion, argues passionately for a rationalist approach to developing a modern morality. He demonstrates convincingly that the automatic neural circuits that have served our purposes extremely well over the last 135 years in reproducing our species are largely ill-suited for life in a technologically sophisticated modern world. Our president frequently refers to his gut instincts in formulating policy and is but one of the innumerable examples of how pre-modern thinking can lead to disaster in the current era. The sooner we stand back from a pre-rationalist instinctual construction of morality and begin to address this important component of human society from a rational point of view, the sooner, as Jeff Sachs said, we are likely to come to terms with what it means to have 6.5 billion large mammals roaming around on this planet. That situation, 6.5 billion large mammals, has never obtained before. How effectively and how rationally we address the issue of morality in the modern age will determine how long the planet will exist in this state. I can state my position simply. I prefer understanding to meaning. And while it may be some time, some considerable time, before we understand our general compulsion to discuss free will, I will contrive to strive to avoid a craving for meaning and expend my energies toward the goal of understanding instead. Thank you. David, where are you? David, thank you. Thank you. Our third speaker is Paul Applebaum. Paul is a physician. He's the Elizabeth Dollard Professor of Psychiatry, Medicine, and Law, and Director of the Division of Psychiatry, Law, and Ethics in the Department of Psychiatry at the College of Physicians and Surgeons Uptown. He was previously the A.F. Zelesnik Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Director of the Law and Psychiatry Program at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. He's the author of many articles and books on law and ethics and clinical practice and research. Past President of the American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law, and the Massachusetts Psychiatric Society, and serves as Chair of the Council on Psychiatry and Law for the American Psychiatric Association. He's been elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a graduate of Columbia College. He has his MD from Harvard and he completed his residency in psychiatry at the Mass Mental Health Center of the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Um, he's also a friend of mine and uh, very much the most recent arriver at Columbia University and we're all the better for it, Paul Applebaum. As I get this up, I'm going to demure from one of the previous comments of, of one of my colleagues, that is, it is not in any way tenured professors who have to persuade you of the importance of what they do. It is our untenured colleagues who have to do that. We really don't. 
give a damn <clears throat> what anybody thinks about uh, what we do. Um, I'm going to be talking with you about uh, behavioral genetics and their relationship uh, to free will. I begin with a uh, caveat, and although uh, given the circumstances here today, this seems almost unnecessary, which is that I am not a behavioral geneticist. Uh, I am a psychiatrist, and therefore I will be talking with you about uh, other people's uh, research here. However, I uh, have for many years uh, been interested in the application of scientific findings to the law and to ethics uh, more broadly, and I think you will see some interesting implications of these data, uh, as you undoubtedly did with uh, Darcy Kelly. Uh, presentation of the neuroimaging data, and in many ways the two run in parallel with similar uh, issues raised and, and similar uh, problems uh, created. So uh, I'm going to begin by reviewing with you some recent advances in behavioral uh, genetics that may help uh, in understanding uh, and predicting uh, a predisposition to violent behavior and other criminal behavior uh, on the part of uh, various people. And then I'm going to ask you to think along with me about the implications of these discoveries and similar discoveries that are almost certain to come uh, in the future for our understandings of personal responsibility. So, as you undoubtedly uh, are aware, uh, our religious traditions often root uh, the possibility of repentance in the principle of absolute free will and uh, for many uh, religious uh, traditions the notion of personal responsibility uh, for one's actions is uh, key. Uh, moreover, uh, our criminal law uh, uh, tradition uh, derived from English common law and elaborated here in this country since uh, independence uh, has a similar basis. We punish only people who we think are responsible uh, for what they've done, as uh, Darcy Kelly outlined briefly uh, for you. However, we presume that all people are responsible for what they've done, uh, barring persuasive evidence uh, to the contrary. And as an example of the uh, dependency of uh, many religious ideas, uh, on uh, the notion of free will. This is an excerpt from Maimonides. You're going to hear more about him in one of the presentations uh, tomorrow, uh, 12th century uh, Jewish philosopher who wrote, free will is bestowed on every human being. If one desires to turn toward the evil way and be wicked, he's at liberty to do so. And thus it's written in the Torah, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil which means that the human species has become unique in the world, namely that man, of himself and by the exercise of his own intelligence and reason, knows what is good and what is evil. And there is none who can prevent him from doing that which is good or which is evil. Well, the challenge we're going to face here uh, today is how these new data that I'm going to talk with you about, as well as the neuroimaging and other neuroscience data you've heard about already, uh, impact these traditional understandings. Uh, whether uh, we should change those traditional notions, and if so, how we should change them, and what the consequences of changing our notions might be. So let me begin with a fast overview of uh, behavioral genetics. For those of you who know more about this than I do, uh, I apologize for the simplistic uh, approach here, but I want to make sure we're all sort of at the same minimal level when we look at uh, the data. Uh, so to date, almost every behavior, any behavior that's been studied uh, by a behavioral geneticist has shown some degree of heritability. Uh, indicating that genes play some role in the behavior's causation. And I'm going to show you uh, some data here from a study by Robert Plowman, who's at the Institute of Psychiatry at the Maudsley uh, in London, uh, and uh, who looked at, uh, let's see if I can get the, uh, whoops. No, I'm not going to get the pointer up. So uh, he looked at the uh, correlation in uh, a very particular kind of behaviors, 
uh, namely a set of sociability related behaviors between identical twins in red and fraternal twins in blue. And the correlation asks uh, simply uh, how related are the behaviors of two identical twins and how related are the behaviors of two non-identical twins. Identical twins have an identical genetic endowment, at least they're born with the same genes, uh, whereas fraternal twins, non-identical twins by definition uh, do not. If you compare the length of the uh, red bars with the uh, length of the blue bars, uh, you'll note immediately that the behaviors of identical twins, even at the toddler stage in babbling at a stranger, looking at a stranger, and approaching uh, a stranger, that is the degree of sociability that they manifest, uh, is much more highly correlated than is true for fraternal twins. Uh, suggesting that there is an important role for genetic endowment in this set of uh, behaviors that we ordinarily think of as part and parcel of an individual's personality. Now, having said that, the other important thing to note uh, is that the uh, scale on the x-axis stops at uh, 0.8. A perfect correlation, an identical set of behaviors, would be a correlation of 1.0. Uh, and no uh, behavior that's been examined here in this study or in any study uh, reaches uh, a complete uh, correlation on the basis of identical genetic endowment, uh, which means that no behavior is entirely determined by genes. Uh, there are other environmental factors that uh, necessarily play uh, a role as well. Moreover, most behaviors that have been examined uh, are not influenced by a single gene, but are likely to be influenced by multiple genes, each of which contributes only a tiny piece to the variance of its expression or uh, absence. Uh, and geneticists refer to these behaviors as complex traits and assume that with multiple genes involved in uh, influencing whether they're present or not, there are simultaneously multiple molecular pathways uh, to get to that same uh, output or phenotype. Now, the key term in behavioral genetics today is gene-environment uh, interactions. And the notion here is that since genetics doesn't do it all and the environment doesn't do it all, that there must be some way they relate to each other. And how might that be? Well, the going hypothesis in uh, most cases is that a particular genetic endowment uh, gives an individual a heightened sensitivity uh, to be influenced by particular environmental occurrences, we'll see an example uh, in a moment, uh, or alternately a diminished uh, sensitivity to uh, environmental uh, influences. And the example I want to tell you about, because it, it plays some important role in, in the, uh, the story uh, and the challenge that we face, uh, is uh, an example of uh, the enzyme monoamine oxidase A, which is an enzyme in our brains and elsewhere in our bodies that breaks down neurotransmitters, those chemicals that carry impulses from one nerve cell uh, to the next and are responsible for triggering the action potentials uh, that you heard about uh, earlier. Uh, and this study of uh, monoamine oxidase A was uh, carried out by Avshalom Caspi and his colleagues, again, at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, which is a hotbed of research, one of the leading centers uh, of research on uh, behavioral genetics, uh, from a, uh, an epidemiologic sample collected many years before in Dunedin, New Zealand. And in this extraordinary study, uh, followed uh, periodically uh, since birth uh, and reevaluated roughly every three years. Now, the data uh, from the study I'm going to uh, tell you about comes from the 26-year follow-up. There has since been a 29-year follow-up, and those data are, as I understand it, on the verge of, uh, of being published as well as they relate to a, uh, a variety of issues. This has been a, an extraordinarily productive uh, research uh, project that Caspi and his colleagues took advantage of. Well, MAOA, the enzyme, 
uh, varies in its level of activity. Your level of activity may be different uh, than mine. Uh, it depends on how much we produce, which in turn uh, depends on uh, the precise structure of a region of our X chromosomes, which is where the gene for MAAO uh, resides, uh, called a promoter region, which regulates how much of the gene uh, that's nearby is uh, produced. Uh, and in this study, uh, CASPI identified some subjects, all males, uh, who had uh, low activity, uh, that is, who had uh, a uh, promoter region that was less efficient at uh, producing uh, or allowing the production of uh, MAOA, uh, and high activity. So he dichotomized uh, his groups. Why was he looking at MAOA in the first place? Well, in a study that had been published about 10 years before in the journal Science, Brunner and his colleagues from the Netherlands had reported on a, a cohort of uh, men uh, in uh, the Netherlands, an extended kindred, uh, a related uh, large family, uh, who shared a, a, a common syndrome. Uh, they uh, tended to have mild mental retardation, uh, and to engage in uh, impulsive illegal behaviors. Some of them trivial, like shoplifting, and some of them quite serious, like attempted rape or assault or arson. Uh, the genetic analysis of this uh, kindred revealed that the affected males all had uh, a defect in their MAOA gene, not in the promoter region, but in the gene itself, uh, that led to the production of inactive MAOA. So they had essentially no MAOA activity. Uh, and the hypothesis of Brenner, Brunner and his group uh, was that uh, MAOA, in some important respect, was involved in the regulation of impulsive behavior. Uh, and that it might not simply be a matter of presence or absence, but perhaps relative amounts of MAOA being present uh, in a given individual that might determine how impulsive that person uh, was. So that's what Caspi and his colleagues uh, looked at, but what they found surprised them uh, a little bit, because low MAOA activity by itself was not associated with impulsive criminal uh, behavior, including uh, violence in this sample. However, among their subjects who had a history of childhood mistreatment, uh, defined in a very particular way for the purpose of this study, uh, the interaction between low MAOA levels and childhood mistreatment led to significantly higher rates of antisocial behavior, uh, including violence. And uh, he, this graph uh, demonstrates that for you. Uh, the dark line are the subjects with uh, low MAOA activity. The light line is high MAOA activity. Uh, and on the x-axis, you can see childhood maltreatment, none probable, uh, and uh, severe, as they defined it, uh, where there's no childhood maltreatment present, it doesn't matter what your MAOA activity level was, uh, you have uh, the same uh, risk uh, on their index of antisocial uh, behavior. And even when there's probable maltreatment uh, present, there's no significant difference between the two groups. However, in the presence of severe childhood maltreatment, although it's true that both groups experience a significant increase in their rate of antisocial behavior, for the group characterized by the black line, that is those with low MAOA activity, uh, there is a significant increment, a very large increment in the risk of antisocial uh, behavior. So there is an interaction between the environmental influence of being uh, abused or maltreated uh, as a child uh, and having low MAOA uh, activity levels that produces an effect not seen to that extent with either of those variables uh, alone. And so uh, when they looked at their numbers, what they uh, found that was that although 
subjects with low MAOA and childhood uh, maltreatment, although they comprised only 12 percent of the sample, accounted for fully 44 percent of the convictions for violent crime uh, in this group. And 85 percent of the subjects who met those two criteria developed some form of antisocial behavior on the four uh, indicator uh, variables that were used uh, in this study. Since the Caspi study came out, there have been uh, a number of efforts to replicate it. Unfortunately, no two studies have used the same methods or looked at the same population. They, didn't they haven't used the same outcome variables. Uh, nonetheless, there have been several replications and a couple of failures uh, to replicate. A recent meta-analysis, however, suggests that this is a real finding. And whatever the future of this finding, I would ask you to assume for the purpose of our discussion here that this is a real finding uh, because uh, if it isn't, it is uh, quite likely that some other uh, genetic finding will in the very near future, and it's possible that one already has, uh, produce similar uh, kinds of uh, results. So what do we do with this data, and how does it impact how we understand the concept of responsibility and in the legal system uh, the notion of punishment of crime and what we as a society might do to prevent crime? Here's our dilemma. In Anglo-American law, as you heard uh, earlier, we've created categories that excuse defendants from culpability when their capacity to choose their behavior uh, is impaired. Either defenses like insanity, uh, I didn't know the difference between right and wrong, or I couldn't control what I was doing, or the so-called aut autonomatism uh, defense, which is exemplified by the case of epilepsy, which uh, you heard about uh, earlier. If as part of a temporal lobe uh, epileptic seizure, I uh, strike the person uh, next to me, the law will not hold me criminal res criminally responsible uh, for that uh, action. So. If mental disorders that impair appreciation of wrongfulness or ability to control uh, behavior, and there are still states in this country that, although the federal government has, uh, has gotten rid of it in, in the federal insanity defense, there are still states in this country that uh, allow irresistible impulse, so-called volitional prong of the insanity defense, uh, to be uh, argued as a basis for exculpation. Uh, if, if they negate a defendant's culpability, well, why shouldn't genetic determinants of behavior uh, have the same effect? Indeed, why shouldn't low MAOA activity uh, serve as the basis to excuse uh, the criminal acts of uh, a defendant? Uh, sure enough, uh, even before the Caspi study, within several years of the uh, Brunner uh, report uh, being published from the cohort in the uh, Netherlands, uh, a writer in a uh, law journal was already proposing a defense of genetic determinism, uh, namely that an actor would be excused for their criminal offense if as a result of some sort of genetic predisposition they either didn't perceive the physical nature or consequence of their conduct, that's pretty unlikely, uh, didn't know that their conduct was wrong or criminal, relatively unlikely, uh, or, and here's the key, was not sufficiently able to control their conduct so as to be held accountable for it. Now this is not the first time that we've heard arguments about genetics introduced in the courtroom. In the 1970s, as some of you uh, may remember, uh, evidence uh, appeared uh, suggesting that men who had an extra Y chromosome, the so-called XYY syndrome, uh, were at increased risk for acts of violence. In a very simplistic uh, paradigm, uh, it was thought that men are more violent than women, men have testosterone, women 
don't have very much testosterone. Uh, so testosterone uh, production is influenced by the Y chromosome. So a man who has two Y chromosomes is probably twice as likely, at least, to be violent as a man with only one Y chromosome, and that's not really his fault. That was sort of the, the basic paradigm uh, here. Uh, and on the basis of some early studies of prison populations, several defendants attempted to introduce evidence that they were XYY uh, to negate their culpability for their criminal acts. Uh, you may or may not uh, be relieved uh, to know this, but uh, many people were relieved when the courts uh, rejected uh, these uh, defenses on a variety of grounds and the problem in a way went away uh, when uh, additional epidemiologically sound data were collected suggesting that XYY, though it may be associated with impulsive and illegal actions, uh, was not particularly associated uh, with violence and therefore uh, couldn't serve as a uh, defense to a uh, charge of having committed uh, a violent crime. And the response to XYY uh, in fact, uh, reflects a much more deeply held view of the law. One which I think many neuroscientists, to be frank, and uh, contemporary philosophers uh, fail to give sufficient credence to, uh, which is embodied in this uh, excerpt from, Chief, uh, from Justice Hugo Black's concurrence in a case called Robinson versus California, a case from the early 60s that dealt with uh, the question of whether uh, drug addiction uh, could be a crime uh, or whether since drug addiction was in some sense compelled behavior, it wasn't fair to hold a person uh, responsible for being a drug addict. Uh, in his concurrence, Justice Black wrote the following. Almost all of the traditional purposes of the criminal law can be significantly served by punishing the person who in fact committed the proscribed act without regard to whether his action was compelled by some elusive, irresponsible aspect of his personality. And in fact, this represents the approach that the courts have taken to the problem of multiple personality disorder, or what we now call dissociative identity disorder uh, in the courts. When defendants have attempted to introduce evidence and make the argument that, Your Honor, it's not really fair to hold me responsible for that criminal act because I wasn't the one who did that. It was one of my alters that was in control of my body that did it, and so why are you punishing me? To which the courts have essentially responded, although not exactly necessarily in these words, uh, look, we don't care how many of you are in there, one of you did it, and the others ought to be more careful who they hang out with, and you're all going to be held responsible for it. The skepticism of the law about these kinds of uh, defenses uh, reflects a deeply embedded view of individuals as intentional actors. And although the law recognizes that behavior is uh, subject to causal influences such as genetic causes or uh, causes based on abnormalities of uh, brain uh, function. Uh, the law is uh, actually uh, not unsophisticated uh, in recognizing that it's not some behaviors that are caused, but all behaviors that are caused. Caused in the sense of being influenced, not just by our genes or how the way our brains are wired, uh, but by the environments that we've been uh, subject to, the uh, friends we've had uh, over the years, the ways in which uh, we were raised, whether we were poor as children or uh, grew up in uh, wealthy uh, families. Uh, however, uh, the law has uh, continued to insist that the mere presence of causal influences doesn't negate an individual's ultimate responsibility to control their behavior. Uh, and only when these influences overwhelm rationality. Think of uh, uh, rationality and choice being overwhelmed by somebody else holding a gun to your head and ordering you to commit uh, a criminal act, which might constitute a defense of uh, compulsion, uh, or the insanity defense uh, as in another uh, example. 
uh, but only when they overwhelm rationality or your ability to control behavior will the law say that you are not truly responsible uh, for what you've done. There's a philosophical uh, grounding for this. I'm not going to go into this in great detail. I suspect we'll hear much more about it tomorrow. There's a uh, philosophical principle of compatibilism that essentially says just because causal influences exist, that doesn't mean that there uh, aren't uh, uh, reasons to believe that individuals still remain ultimately capable of uh, choosing uh, how they act. Uh, but perhaps even more importantly, it has a very strong consequentialist uh, justification here. Uh, that is, it has been the observation of law makers and law givers uh, over the uh, centuries and millennia uh, that the more incentives we give people to conform their behavior uh, to the law, uh, the less likely they are to break the law. Uh, and uh, recognizing the vast variety of causal influences as exculpating people from responsibility uh, is likely in this view to have the effect of freeing them from the constraints of the law, uh, which would hardly be a uh, positive uh, uh, state uh, in which, uh, to, br to which to bring our uh, society. Now, this uh, genetic evidence that uh, is uh, lurking uh, out there uh, is um, going to face this set of uh, problems when uh, people in attempt to introduce it uh, in court, the inherent skepticism of the law and, and a sense that uh, genetic causes are not all that much different from any other cause uh, and no cause. Uh, except in rare circumstances uh, should exculpate behavior. So this is a transcript, an excerpt from a transcript of testimony given by a psychologist in California at a sentencing hearing actually for a uh, defendant. Uh, and he's being cross-examined by uh, the uh, district attorney, assistant district attorney. Here's how the colloquy goes. Are you saying that the defendant, because he has the MAOA gene and because in your opinion he suffered maltreatment, was unable to control his behavior, and that caused him to commit these three murders? Uh, no, I'm not. And in fact, the defendant could easily have made a choice as to whether or not he wanted to commit three murders, couldn't he? Uh, I, I don't know how easy or difficult his choices are. But there's nothing in the MAOA gene or the severe maltreatment, both of which were apparently present in this case, that would make him commit those murders, is there? Uh, I don't know. Well, the expert in this case, at the very least, had the virtue of being honest uh, and recognizing what he couldn't say. Uh, but that is a problem for the use of behavioral genetic uh, data in our legal system uh, today, which is uh, that the law in order to excuse is looking for tight causal links between influences and behaviors uh, that constitute either a compulsion or near compulsion to act in a particular way or so confuse the individual about the morality of their action uh, that is, the rightfulness or wrongfulness of their action, uh, that they're no longer substantially able to tell uh, the difference between uh, the two. Uh, and it is very unlikely that uh, behavioral genetic data will get us uh, to that place. However, you might uh, say, well, look, even if you're not going to exculpate somebody who carries an MAOA uh, gene, maybe you ought at least to take this into account in, in mitigating their sentence. Maybe we should see them not as irresponsible, but as having diminished responsibility. And sure enough, not long after the Brunner uh, study was published uh, in a Georgia case called Mobley, uh, a uh, defendant uh, made an argument that the court uh, should provide funds to test whether or not uh, he had uh, MAOA uh, impairment uh, or low MAOA levels, uh, an attempt which the court uh, rejected. Uh, 
Uh, but frankly, many of our uh, legal colleagues, particularly uh, the criminal defense bar, uh, is on top of these studies before many people in biology and medicine and neuroscience uh, know about uh, these studies. Uh, there have been relatively few cases uh, to date specifically uh, introducing uh, genetic data, but I know of some uh, forensic evaluators, a team at, at Vanderbilt in, in Tennessee, which is now routinely getting this in death penalty uh, cases for the defendants that they evaluate and attempting to introduce these data in court, not on questions of guilt or culpability, but on uh, issues of mitigation in sentencing. Uh, but whether these data actually cut in the direction that the advocates uh, of their use uh, believes, believe they cut uh, is something to uh, pause and uh, think about. Here's the argument that a defense attorney is actually making in one of these cases. Your Honor, because of his genetic propensities, my client cannot control his behavior and thus is much more likely than the average defendant to do what he did again. And therefore, I plead for leniency in sentencing him. You can see there's a little conceptual misalignment there that the courts have not been oblivious to. So let me see if I've got a, uh, whoops, I had, I guess I didn't put it in here, okay. Uh, th there is a, a wonderful excerpt from a, uh, a court, uh, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, Federal Court of Appeals in California, in a case called Landrigan, uh, in which uh, the judges uh, uh, rejected a claim that Landrigan had had ineffective assistance of counsel because genetic data had not been introduced on his behalf. Uh, they said, uh, frankly, to ask us to rule uh, that uh, Landrigan would be entitled to mercy uh, on the basis that he committed these three heinous murders uh, because uh, he uh, carried uh, genes that uh, made him more likely uh, to commit murder uh, is beyond uh, credulity. Uh, and uh, they dismissed uh, the, uh, the appeal uh, out of hand. Let me, as I'm uh, winding down here, uh, just consider one more uh, issue uh, with you, and that is how these data uh, might be taken into account in uh, thinking about preventing crime. After all, if we can identify a group at high risk for uh, violent and other criminal behaviors, which the Caspian colleague data's data suggests uh, that we can, uh, are we entitled to use that information in any way to protect us, the, the uh, social uh, system, uh, from that behavior in a prospective way? Well, uh, a suggestion was made uh, within a year of the publication of the CASPI data, uh, again in a law review article, uh, that male victims of child abuse should all be screened for their MAOA levels, and if they have low levels, they ought to be snatched from their families uh, and you know, taken away to be raised properly. Uh, there are no limit to the, to the problems created by that suggestion, one of which is we haven't quite figured out as a society what we do with people after we snatch them uh, from their families that ensures that in fact they're raised properly. Uh, from a scientific perspective, we don't know that the damage hasn't already been done by the time they've been abused and that subsequent good rearing, even if we could guarantee it, would really uh, make a difference. And then we get into the constitutional issues, which I won't even mention uh, here. Um, but what kind of effect, I just ask you to think about, would labeling people as high risk for violence actually have on their lives uh, thereafter? Uh, what do the schools do with such people? What do the courts do with such people? Are they more likely to sentence them uh, more harshly rather than more leniently? A and what impact does it have on the kids themselves if they learn that they're low MAOA, that they carry a violence gene? Or maybe you would call it a warrior uh, gene. Consider this article uh, from about a year and a half ago in the Daily Telegraph, the British paper. Wellington, New Zealand. 
Maori leaders reacted furiously yesterday after a scientist said that their race carried a warrior gene, this is our gene, M-A-O-A, -A, that predisposed them to violence and criminal behavior. A genetic epidemiologist told an international conference that Maori men were twice as likely as Europeans to bear monoamine oxidase, which sounds terrible, he didn't get the science quite right there. A gene that is also connected with risk-taking behaviors such as smoking and gambling, which seems to be true. He was reported as saying the discovery went a long way to explaining some of the problems that Maoris had in New Zealand. So it's not socioeconomic deprivation, societal discrimination, or anything, or cultural factors for that matter, it's genes. And best of all, here's the picture that accompanied the article with the caption. <clears throat> now, you tell me that this is not a potentially enormously stigmatizing thing to know about individuals or for that matter uh, about groups. So uh, let me um, get to my conclusions uh, here. Um, it seems to me inevitable that as with the neuroscience findings focused on uh, brain activation, the fMRI data that we were looking at and hearing about earlier, uh, our knowledge of the genetic roots of behavior, uh, including bad behavior, uh, is going to increase markedly, maybe exponentially, in the coming years we will be able uh, to identify genes and alleles that either by themselves or in combination with other influences put people at high risk for violence and uh, other crime. And our knowing this is gonna raise many questions about how we respond to crime and prevent crime. I don't believe uh, barring some radical change in our legal system, which I do not think is uh, likely to be forthcoming, uh, that genetic information is gonna have a huge impact uh, on our rules for excusing criminal behavior, and I would say the same thing about uh, the fMRI uh, neuroimaging uh, data. It may play a greater role in determining appropriate punishments, however, whether it's seen as an aggravating factor or a mitigating factor, uh, is likely to depend heavily on whether there's anything we can do about it. So if someday I can give you a pill to compensate for your low MAOA levels, well, that's a pretty good reason for thinking about mitigation as long as we can be sure that you will, in fact, continue to take that pill. Uh, but if I can't, then uh, a society that uh, chooses to turn such people loose selectively uh, is uh, a society that arguably is uh, asking for uh, certain kinds of trouble. Moreover, this knowledge is gonna give us the ability to screen for predispositions uh, to crime, uh, which could, if we use the ability, result in the creation of a stigmatized class of high-risk uh, people, but that pressure to, grow, to screen likely will grow if there's something we can do uh, about it. I will tell you that already on the internet today, uh, you can uh, order uh, from home uh, tests for a remarkable uh, variety of genetic predispositions or presumed genetic predispositions. There's now a test out there which purports to tell you whether you have an increased risk for bipolar disorder, manic depressive uh, disease. Uh, and uh, there's a company that's talking about introducing uh, an MAOA test so that you could swab your kid's cheeks and discover whether little Johnny is gonna grow up to be public enemy number one uh, or not. Uh, no doctors involved, it's direct from consumer to the uh, genetic testing uh, lab. Uh, this is the wave of the uh, genetic future. Um, I would suggest to you, however, uh, that these data don't compel us to abandon ideas of free will and personal responsibility, either s religious notions or uh, legal notions. Uh, genetic predispositions influence behavior. They don't determine our behavior. 
Uh, to be sure, they may lead to some people having more trouble conforming to social norms uh, than others, but there's no evidence yet that it is beyond their powers to shape their own behaviors. Uh, and given the consequences, we probably ought to insist on pretty good evidence uh, that that's true before we back away from our uh, traditional approaches here. So thank you for your attention. People forget, uh, Paul's kind of sat down, but please, I'd like Paul and Darcy and David to come back up here, take seats, we open up a discussion, and uh, people who will have questions, please come to the microphones, which are in the aisles, and I hope you will all have questions for each other, but even if you don't, that's what we're gonna do now. So, thank you. An aspect of someone's uh, life as a tenured professor or even a professor who wishes not to be but is nevertheless thought often to be tenured is that he or she is not used to being told what to say nor even to answer a question. So far be it for me to ask any of my colleagues any questions, but I hope they might have some questions for each other. And there will be questions at the mic. Um, all right. I'm, I, 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 I'm of, I, I really am of no strong conviction. Let's start with somebody at a mic then. Wait, wait, let's get a mic that works before we start at a mic. Here comes our mic fixer. One, two. <laughs> okay, wow, that's a lot of reverb. <laughs> I really enjoyed those presentations. I would like to ask two questions. And first, I would like to ask Dr. Applebaum. Uh, today was the second time that I came across MAOA as a term. The first time was a couple of weeks ago when I was reading part of Essential Psychopharmacology and the new wave of antidepressants, which were MAOIs, uh, MAO inhibitors, and they distinguished between MAOA and MAOB inhibitors. Um, MAOB inhibitors were a little uh, better towards preventing hypertension, et cetera. But I'm wondering if there's any possible uh, utilization of antidepressants in ameliorating something like low MAO uh, activity. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the antidepressants that you're referring to are MAO, are MAO act Inhibitors. They're inhibitors. It's and not so really If anything, inhibitor. they reduce okay. MAO uh, activity. Uh, now, you might ask, as a consequence of that, when we give MAOs, MAOs, MAOIs, the inhibitors, uh, to patients with depression or, or other uh, disorders for which they're used, do we see increased rates of impulsivity, violent behavior, uh, aggression, etc.? Uh, and to my knowledge, that has never been looked at uh, systematically. Uh, now, of course, uh, the data from Caspi et al. would suggest that there's only a subset uh, in which you'd expect to see such uh, a response, namely those who had uh, childhood maltreatment, but, but that would be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. But in any event, uh, that uh, unfortunately wouldn't be a great strategy for compensating uh, for uh, MAOA uh, deficits. Uh, in uh, these populations. No, so the opposite, something that, okay. And for Dr. Kelly, um, Phineas T. Gage is, was his brain, so in a, uh, a consideration such as this, uh, would somebody with severe, uh, especially frontal lobe uh, damage, 
be culpable or not if they became violent. That's just all hypothetical. Well, you know, the law has many goals, and one of them is safety and containment. Uh, now, Gage himself was not a violent person, was never locked up, but he clearly suffered a big change in his, uh, in his approach to life. Um, it all boils down to what you think the law ought to do. If you think the law is retributive, that the goal of the law is to punish people who do bad things, then the issue of culpability is very important. If, on the other hand, you think that the goal of the law is to make the society safer, then your goals are somewhat different. Then you want to know, is somebody doing bad things to such an extent that they can't help it? In which case, containment is the argument. You wouldn't care if they were guilty or not. You just would want to prevent them from hurting other people, unless you could treat them. And we have, by and large, abandoned the treatment, the rehabilitation ethic that we had for quite a while. And as we learn more about ways of preventing behavior that is difficult for the society to manage, we'll want to think more and more about treatment. Right at the moment, we're not thinking about it a lot. No, thank you. We'll take it, alternate mics. Marie Fricognon, Philosophy, William Patterson University. I have a question for uh, Professor Helpen. I'm a little frightened about addressing this question with you because I know what you think about the philosophical question of free will, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, it seems to me there's two possibilities. Either time is real or time is unreal. If in, a, in the ordinary sense of the passage of time, if time is real, then at any moment of t time, in terms of a cross-section of the universe, you have con interrelated conditions that are sufficient to produce the next moment in a causal sense. Or if there's randomness, then we have to consider that too. But in either case, if the causes occur, then the result will occur, and then I'm determined. Or if it's random, it's like me turning randomly into a rabbit right now. It's not something that I can help. On the other hand, if there's no time, if in some sense of relativity, I'm thinking maybe of Gert Gerdel's solutions to some of Einstein's field equations, supposing there is a sense in which we don't have the ordinary passage of time, then um, everything is as it is from forever, from all eternity or for no eternity, because you can't even use a temple notion. So then I'm asking you and the other members of the panel, if this is, if, if I've said it out properly, um, where do you find the space for freedom? I give up. <laughs> <laughs> The, the notion, I, I always start my classes on relativity with asking the students to define time without using time in the definition. Right? It's a somewhat difficult thing to do. Um, I, I like Ted Harrison's view on this also. He, he defines it as a wave of vividity. So, you know, you have a very vivid notion of what you were just doing at the microphone. You don't maybe remember what you were doing last Tuesday very well. And when you were three years old, you don't remember anything at all. Um, but that's a human-centered version of time. We, we think we have an objective notion of time, or rather of space-time, uh, in Einstein's relativity, the normal solutions of Einstein's relativity. And we, it, it, but it does not mean that time is an absolute quantity. In fact, the point of relativity is that time is relative, and its passage is relative uh, regarding the motion of the observers uh, and, and the sources. So I guess, I'm at a loss as to the notion of how that connects to freedom. I think freedom is a human construction or human notion, and it, like everything else human, exists within an, a universe that is sort of indifferent to our existence, and as a consequence, space-time behaves in a way which we currently model with relativity, which may well be incorrect but it's our current best model for it. And our notion of freedom, I think your, your freedom to turn into a rabbit is something for you to define because it's an inherently subjective notion that is not part of the fabric of, of, of the universe. No, I know you didn't prefer, prefer to turn into a rabbit. That was, that was if time were random. I, I, 
there, there have been people discussing discreteness of time. Dis the time is discrete rather than continuous. Uh, I haven't seen that idea, which has been around for decades, actually contribute anything to our understanding of the universe. So the, the notion of random scrambling of time, which some people talk about in the first fraction of a second of the Big Bang, uh, again, is an interesting but sort of inconsequential concept, I think. I'll, I'll uh, since you asked the rest of us, I, I would say that since you ask an anatomical question where, it seems to me that Professor Kelly's answer is very clear, in the mind, which is an excrescence of the brain, as Darwin said. Uh, the notion of freedom, I agree with David, is a mental notion. It's an aspect of the mental world. It's as real or unreal, natural or unnatural, as anything else in the mental world as distinct from the physical world or the natural world. Uh, it's clear we can imagine things which can't be so. Uh, David himself said there are things that can't be so. They are, in principle, unknowable. The position of every atom from first principles from the beginning of the universe is, in principle, unknowable. Yet we can imagine it by asking the question. So I would not agree with David that because it's a mental construct, therefore it is of no interest and no value, but I would certainly feel comfortable locating it in the heads of those of us who will remember this discussion as a neuronal rewiring. Now I'm going to violate my own precept by free will and take the next question from Professor Towns so that he doesn't have to stand there <laughs> any longer than necessary. Charlie Towns. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> discuss the question of uh, genetic properties making a person maybe do something that's wrong, should they be punished? Uh, it seems to me we have the same problem for a child who has been abused by parents, that then they probably have more tendency to do something wrong. Uh, does that mean they should be excused completely? It seems to me those are really quite parallel and the same problem. With, uh, so. Uh, uh, very hard, very hard to separate between the genetics and the upbringing, in terms of what the nature of the person is. Yeah, I actually think that's exactly right, and um, there, there is a there's a literature out there now from some of our colleagues in in neuroscience who are excitingly brandishing their fMRI scans and uh, saying, you know, w we can now show where somebody is impaired in their decision making, uh, and that should be enough to excuse them from culpability or to diminish the punishment they receive uh, for their criminal acts. But I think they make the argument without recognizing that we've known about causal influences on criminal behavior for uh, decades, uh, in fact, uh, uh, longer. Uh, we know that if you grow up in a poor neighborhood with uh, a poor education and with few social supports and surrounded by social disorganization, uh, and uh, particularly if you're abused uh, as a child uh, as well, uh, you are likely to, you are more likely than uh, someone who grew up in different circumstances to engage in criminal uh, behavior. We have generally chosen uh, not to take that into account in uh, exculpation. Uh, and uh, our response so far to the genetic data and the neuroimaging data has largely been uh, along the same lines. Uh, the neuroscientists, some neuroscientists, uh, are arguing for a kind of uh, neuroscience exceptionalism, if you will, uh, that their data, their causal influence is different because it resides in the brain, but of course the effect of early childhood deprivation resides in the brain as well, and I think uh, uh, we have sometimes failed to see the correspondence between those two kinds of, of causal influences. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that neuroscience will uh, evolve in the near future to such extent that the predictive power of tools like fMRIs or genetic maps or the environmental influences will be so high that educational institutions like schools or employers will use that data uh, to decide whether to accept someone to a school like Hunter, for example, or whether to promote someone? Because the truth is that today, schools and employers use psychological tools like Sanford Burnett to decide whether to accept a child or not. So do you see a practical application of these types of tools in the future 
that they will give a better predictive uh, ability, if you will, to an education institution or employer to decide whether to accept or promote or, or, or fire someone? Well, there are two parts to that. One is that no one part of the brain will ever tell you anything about anybody's potential because the brain is a huge network of interconnected neurons, each of which influence the other. So if I told you, uh, which is actually true, that people with very active prefrontal cortices tend to be very reserved and careful and circumspect, right? That doesn't actually mean that everybody with a very large prefrontal cortex is reserved and circumspect. Part of the problem here is that we don't have huge masses of normative data. We don't know what the normative variation is in anything. One good thing about the Caspi Center uh, study was that it was a prospective study. They made no assumptions at the beginning about the 426 uh, babies, young children that they were following. So they had normative data. But if you look at something like the size of the prefrontal cortex, we don't run around measuring it. And even if we did, it wouldn't tell us everything. The other thing, which is really important, is that you know a certain level of smarts is required for some things. But as you and I both know, the will is all, right? You know that people, people have extraordinary potential, uh, but they may not want to do it. You could have the world's most lovely voice, but you don't want to be an opera singer. You want to be a scientist for some ungodly reason. So the, the passions of life, which are, I think, very largely a result of your upbringing and your experience, often hold a much stronger sway over your ability to succeed in the complicated things that we do as human beings. So I don't think that we're going our kids are going to have to have brain scans to see if they get into Hunter Elementary School. I rule that one out. And I don't even think what they now use, which they use the IQ test to see if the kids can get in. I don't even even think that does right. They can't measure the passion of a four-year-old, right? And so they're always going to make some arbitrary set of mistakes. And finally, who's to say that getting into Hunter is the be-all and end-all of, you know, success in life? So we have to realize that the way, you know, we're such complicated human beings that the chances that any one piece of information about our nervous system will uh, be able to, will enable us to predict with 100% certainty any one aspect of our behavior is probably zero. But it can, it can bias. There's absolutely no doubt. You can see what the predisposition is. But you know, we're pretty good at overcoming our predispositions sometimes. It reminds me a little bit of the criminal justice system, right? Either you're guilty or innocent. Well, either you know, you're a smart four-year-old or not a smart four-year-old. It's kind of ridiculous, let's face facts. But you have to decide somehow, and this seems like some sort of logical algorithm, so you can't blame them for falling on, back on what can be measured as opposed to thinking about what should be measured. Thank you. You know, the, 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 Bob, may I, uh, yeah, let me just in, in interject uh, one other uh, consideration here, which is the real danger in the immediate future is not that we're going to be able to predict people's future behavior on the basis of their genetics or their brain functioning uh, to any significant extent. It's that we will think that we can, uh, that we will seize on partial findings, weak correlations, uh, it's going on already in the advertising for the genetic tests that are, are uh, on the internet. Just go home after this talk and, and Google genetic testing and see what comes up. I think, I think you'll be a, a, amazed. Uh, and to prevent that from happening, uh, we may in fact need some degree of societal intervention. Uh, there has been uh, legislation before Congress for the last five years to prohibit the use of genetic tests for discriminatory purposes by employers and uh, insurers. Uh, and uh, although at one time or another it's passed one house or the other, it has never uh, passed both houses and been signed uh, by the president. This year, uh, it passed both houses for the first time, but my understanding is it's still sitting on the president's desk. Uh, so that kind of uh, regulatory intervention may well be necessary to prevent us from making big mistakes uh, because of precisely the tendencies that you're asking about. Uh, no, no DNA samples are taken, but we are recording this, so please give a name and some place where you're from. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Noam Rudnick, and I'm currently um, working at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Applebaum um, briefly mentioned uh, substance um, dependence, and I was hoping could revisit that briefly. Um, so, for instance, you know, 
some, the vast majority of people who smoke cigarettes can't seem to quit. Um, and uh, I was wondering to what extent can we treat addiction as a disorder of free will? Um, how useful or detrimental would that be to actually helping patients? And uh, would it increase, might it uh, incre <clears throat> increase receptivity to uh, recent uh, interventions such as smoking cessation aids or other anti-addiction pills? We need a 10 second pause while tapes get switched so that the recording, we're good? We're good. Yeah, really. Now it's okay to answer. Yes, okay. Um, substance abuse is a, is a fascinating uh, issue with regard to these uh, questions and a paradox. Uh, it has been recognized for many years uh, even though we don't have the gene that we can point to, uh, that uh, different people have different levels of predisposition to becoming uh, addicted to substances uh, on being exposed uh, to those substances, whether it's nicotine uh, or uh, alcohol or uh, uh, opiates. Uh, and uh, it seems likely before very long that we will have uh, identified some of those genes and there are candidate genes uh, already. Um, and so it, it does look as though uh, for some people it's harder not to become addicted uh, than it is uh, for others. Uh, I say it's a paradox because the most effective treatments that we have to date for uh, are the 12-step programs which are predicated entirely on an individual taking full responsibility for his or her addiction and resolving to turn it around. Uh, and although they talk in terms of surrendering control to a, a higher power, uh, in fact, they're recognizing a full individual responsibility for uh, behavior and endowing the individual with the capacity, much as Maimonides did in the quote that I showed you uh, at the beginning, uh, for acting uh, well or acting uh, poorly. Uh, and um, I think there's something for us to ponder there about the utilitarian consequences of our conceptualizations, regardless uh, of where the science uh, may, uh, may point us. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, yes, and yeah. name? Uh -huh. Kathy Rich, I'm a writer. I have a book coming out on language with Houghton Mifflin um, off that subject. Can anyone on the panel tell me if there have been any um, recent brain findings into this sociopathic um, or psychopathic brain and free will? Okay. Anybody? Well, yes, but nothing to write home about. Uh, and partly because of this problem of not having a huge database. I mean, for all you know, so there is this finding that there's a correlation between the size, whatever that means, of the prefrontal area and, uh, how can I say, abnormal impulse control, okay? And in its most severe form, that can lead to sociopathic bad behavior. But what we don't know, we know that for people who've exhibited bad impulse control. We don't know that for people who haven't exhibited bad impulse control. So for the moment, um, although you have this association, it's a positive association within a single group, you don't know about its association across other groups. Um, and it's a problem. Uh, it's a problem for all of science when you rely on correlation, and that's the basic uh, information that you get from an fMRI. All you get is one thing, you link it to another, and being able to uh, move from correlation to causation is difficult when you don't have enough information. Okay, thank you. I, I, want, I would like to take a moment to ask David Helfand a question that occurs to me. Um, I, I thought when you said that point about the calculation of the position of atoms in, in, in time to make a statement of prediction about any event in history was intrinsically impossible, intrinsically unknowable. It raised to me the question, and I didn't write it down, I just remembered it. Have you a sense of where that boundary lies between what is currently unknown and what is intrinsically unknowable, and whether, in fact, that boundary itself is in the knowable or in the unknowable? <laughs> 
Yes, it is a Talmudic <laughs> question. <laughs> and this guy has a young one on me. Um, <laughs> is that good or bad that it's a Talmudic question? <laughs> oh, it's good, I guess. Well, um, I, I think it depends how simple a question you're trying to ask. I, I, I do think that within our current state of what we call understanding, which consists of having models with calculable predictions, you could, we know the number of atoms in the universe, you could calculate the size of a computer you could make with such a number of atoms, and you could therefore infer what size problem you could tackle. But first of all, I'm not sure that our current method of model building and calculation is the ultimate method of model building and calculation. Uh, people have referred to emergent phenomena here. It, it tends to be synonymous with magic mostly, but in fact there are things that are emergent phenomena coming from large numbers of particles that we don't understand. Uh, and so, you know, it's conceivable we could either develop new, completely new notions of what a model is or completely new notions of what calculation is, in which case that would change those boundaries. So, no, I don't think there's, I, I won't give you a number right now. Uh, my name is Paul Rao. I am a medical physicist, but now retired. I don't know much about either genetics or neuroscience, but lately I have been hearing quite a bit of discussion about top-down processes in the operation of life and nature in general. Therefore, my question to you is, in terms of free will, are there any operational factors that as human beings, what we do might influence our genes, either at the neuroscientific level or environmental influences at the cellular level. Do they influence our genes themselves? Well, I could only respond in a, in a very uh, partial way. The, the most active, and again, with the caution that I'm not a geneticist, the most act, one of the most active areas of, of uh, genetic investigation right now is uh, on what are called epigenetic factors, uh, namely uh, modifications not of the genome itself, but of the proteins uh, surrounding uh, the DNA. Uh, that affect the likelihood that genes will be transcribed or transcribed correctly, number of copies produced, uh, et cetera. Uh, and there is uh, beginning to be evidence, as, as I understand this area, uh, that in fact environmental influences can be highly uh, uh, effective in, in uh, altering uh, those epigenetic uh, uh, variables. Um, that uh, substance abuse, to take one example, uh, may make future substance abuse more likely because of, of changes in the protein structure uh, uh, of the histones surrounding uh, the DNA uh, as just one, uh, one example. So the answer is, is yes, there seems to be an environmental feedback that actually affects the transcription uh, process. So, but not at the genome level, but only at the protein level. That's what you're saying. Well, you know, you all, every cell in your body has the same genes, but a liver cell is very different from a brain cell. So at some point, the environment in which cells develop determine what you get out. And some genes are quiet, and some genes are roaring away. And in some cases, influence from the outside can completely shut down a gene. Um, or completely turn it on in, in an appropriate way. And this is true of your nervous system. You know, you're, when you're born or when your brain is being formed, it doesn't know what body it's going to find itself in. It learns about the body as it grows, right? From the very moment you have the first uh, activity in the brain, the brain is responding to its environment. It's always a two-way street. So, you know, we say you are your brain, but that doesn't mean that your brain doesn't change. When you walk out of this room, your brain's going to be different than when you walked into the room, and mine too. Thank you. 
Hi. My name is Joyce Schenkine. I'm a neuropsychologist. And it's a very quick question. It's just relating to the data that show re, uh, correlations in identical twins that are greater than uh, fraternal twins in reaction to stranger. I always wonder in those cases, what about the individual himself? Like, I myself, as gregarious as I might be, don't always respond the same way to strangers. So even if you compared me to myself, I'm not, I don't show 100% correlation. Yeah, and, and of course, there are other problems with twin studies as well, relating to the environmental influences on identical twins and how they may differ from uh, those influences on, on fraternal twins. What the twin studies give us is uh, a, an inference. They give us a suspicion, a reason to believe that there may in fact be uh, genetic factors. We only know, in some sense, that there are uh, genetic factors playing a role here when we're able to follow up on those hints and uh, identify the actual uh, genes. That being said, those differences in correlations were pretty striking and uh, are, are likely to represent real findings of, of uh, uh, the hereditability of, of, those, uh, of those behaviors. Yeah, I mean, like, I would predict that if disappointment made a difference in how readily you looked at a stranger, my identical twin would react the same way as I would to the disappointing event, and we wouldn't look, let's say. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Leo Downs from Uptown Columbia campus. And I am, I like to raise a qu two questions. One has to do with the embryogenesis and the neurogenesis. And um, <clears throat> if you look at the neurogenesis and you look at the hippocampal, olfactory bulb, dentate gyrus, how, when you, how would you think about neuronal migration? Neuronal migration. In case of, if it's speaking about free will, would it be possible to start from this level, from embry embryogenic and, and neurogenic position first, and then move into free will? Because if the neuronal migration, something should go around and they're connecting to different areas, I'm trying to tease that out, so maybe you all could give me some help on that. Well, I, there are two things that, so the, the brain has a plan. It knows, every cell in the brain knows roughly where it is, even at the point where they're dividing. And then they start to migrate or they send out those thin processes, right? But mm -hmm. while this is all occurring, they're also being influenced by every cell around them. So that the brains of two identical twins are not going to be identical because there's so many cells that the interactions that they'll have with different cells will perforce make their cells different. And actually, do you remember Cy, Cy Leventhal's? So we had a wonderful guy in the department called Cy Leventhal, and he made isogenic organisms that were exactly the same. They were clones of each other, but their nerve cells were different because during the process of development, there's so many uh, contacts between different cells and they each have a probabilistic nature that they come out to be different. So the, I, I don't prefer not to think about this problem in terms of free will and that it imputes some sort of intention to the developing nerve cell, which I don't think the developing nerve cell possesses. But I prefer to think about it as an interplay between the environment and the intrinsic instructions that each cell has and what it's about to become. And I think that's true of the brain as well. And I think that's also true of genetics predispositions. There's a complement, but how those genes play out depends very heavily on the context in which they're expressed. And just to put a number to that, the number I really yeah. like, um, between the fourth and eighth month of pregnancy, mm -hmm. there are 600,000 neurons per minute migrating up the neuronal tube and landing where they're roughly supposed to be in the brain. So I think imputing a plan to that would be very difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I'm uh, Peter Steiner, and I'm a citizen of New York. I live about eight miles from Columbia. Um, this question is more in the context of the everyday, uh, or if you'd like, the, the court of the family and, and uh, relationships. 
and it, it has to do with what we might know now, or what you could tell us we know about free will and the somewhat common experience of being um, emotionally hijacked, let's say, by something someone says or does, and that behavior repeats itself over, over time, and it seems in that moment that we have no free will, or at least to me. And um, while it is possible to change behavior over time, perhaps through the intervention of psychotherapy or other means. Um, why is it that we continue to behave in ways that maybe aren't too healthy? And it seems as if we really can't help it. And I'm speaking generally, but perhaps for myself, more specifically. Well, you know, I think my answer to that question will be similar to my answer to the question about substance abuse. Uh, which is uh, to say that uh, uh, we all tend to behave in habitual ways. Uh, in the case of substance abuse, for one reason relating to a, a set of reinforcers, exogenous reinforcers, uh, in the sense of, in, in the case of uh, responding to other people and, and situations around us uh, in the same way, even when we've responded that way in the past and it's been unproductive or or counterproductive uh, because of a, uh, uh, a set of triggers of behaviors we have learned and that have become uh, habitual uh, for us. Uh, but the paradox is the same as with substance abuse as well. Uh, if um, we understand that behavior as fully caused and therefore not susceptible to your uh, voluntary intervention, then you may as well not come to me for psychotherapy because uh, it, it's uh, not going to do any good. Uh, the premise of psychotherapy is, uh, in fact, by gaining, or at least some psychotherapies, by gaining insight into uh, what it is that triggers uh, your behavior uh, and recognizing that there are other ways to respond. Uh, in those situations, uh, we've now opened up a new set of options for you to consider and new paths uh, for you uh, to follow. Uh, now, you could say that all that is is the introduction of different influences in the person of the therapist uh, and a different set of learned uh, experiences that will uh, trigger a, a different set of uh, responses in the future. And I suppose if, if that's the way you want to think about it, you can, but I, um, again, on uh, utilitarian grounds, uh, would be inclined to believe that uh, seeing ourselves as having some control uh, over the we way we behave is probably uh, preferable and more likely to lead uh, to behavior change in the future. You know, you've just confirmed what I always believed, that there really is no free will without psychotherapy. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, it would have been too self-serving for me to say that, so I'm glad yeah. you did. Now, I, I am going to, unless David or Darcy want to say anything on that question, it's 6.30. David, you want to say a last word? I, well, I just wanted to say something on that question. Don't underestimate 135,000 years of evolution. A huge fraction of what your brain does is done by automatic circuits that have been selected for from natural selection pressures over a long period of time, which, to reiterate myself, are not necessarily appropriate in the world we live in today, but have been for the last 99.9% .9 of human history. I, I would take the last word then to say, do not underestimate the capacity of talking to someone else to modulate those old habits. <laughs> and with that, I want to thank everybody. Come back tomorrow at 10. If you are not registered, register on the way out. If you have a friend who isn't registered, have them send an email, please, or just show up. We'll see you tomorrow at 10. Thank you. <laughs>